Uh, okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's start second day of Wisdom University of Applied Science Scientific Conference, Society Technologies and Solutions. And uh, before we're starting this program and uh, first panel discussion, uh, it's my honor to give floor uh, to Professor Agita Levin to say some couple of words, uh, introduction speech of this conference. Yeah, please, Agita. Agita is uh, not only a professor, you can come already, but director of our Institute for Social Sciences, Economics and Humanities. Please, Agita. Floor is yours. Good morning, esteemed guests, colleagues, schoolers, and participants here in person and joining us online. As we gather for the second day of the Wittsema University of Applied Sciences International Scientific Conference, I am delighted to welcome you all to explore the theme of society technologies solutions. The backbone theme of this year is the study of the historic gross domestic product of Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania over a timeline of 100 years, starting from 1920 to the present. Does research make sense? What does research in history field? Can lessons be drawn from it for tomorrow? Such issues play out quite often, especially in the public space and in studies of narrow disciplines. 20 years ago, I had unique opportunity to develop the structure and content of the first review report, Development of Regions in Latvia, 2003. As I initially drafted the report's outline proposal, I incorporated a comprehensive review chapter focusing on the historical development of the regions. The idea of chapter uh, was to describe how past historical events and circumstances have significantly influenced the present day trajectory of the regions. My vision was a half of one page review of each region. I also got answers that it is impossible to write such a short piece about the historical influence on social economic aspects and that the report will focus on social economic trends and future support for the regions, but not on history. I found one historian uh, who wrote about the Celia, but of course it was more longer than one page. Its historical section failed uh, for this report 20 years ago. And now, uh, in 100 years, uh, how uh, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania evolved. How, how local authorities, local government borders, population and population structure changed. How countries been able to feed themselves and supply themselves. Over the past three years, an international and interdisciplinary research team consisting of different generations of researchers has studied his historic uh, gross domestic product of Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania over a century. This ambitious project is financially supported by European Economic Area grants through the Baltic Research Programme. Today, we celebrate the culmination of this research project and dive into the broader research themes as the well loss of creative industries and pupil engagement in science. Technologies are mainly used as research tools to obtain, organize, and provide comparative data analysis. A new open access database of 100 years of data for all Baltic countries is being developed. Also, technologies are applied to highlight and interpret art in different ways, for example, by virtual reality, audio augmented reality, and artificial intelligence for visualizations and for specific target groups. Finally, the conference itself, as a discussion and networking place, generates and shapes new ideas, solutions to complex challenges and collaborative networks to address issues that face our communities, security, and technologies. 
We are proud to host the conference in Valmier, which will include participants from Estonia, Lithuania, Norway, Finland, Greece, Ukraine and Latvia. I encourage each of you to actively participate, share your insights and forge meaningful connections that will propel us toward a brighter tomorrow. And uh, after this uh, short uh, uh, speech, we will follow up with the panel discussion moderated by the Baltic 100 project team leader, lead researcher, Gattis Kruminch. And then uh, we will continue our uh, work day uh, with parallel sessions. And at the end of the day, uh, we will uh, conclude with uh, final uh, uh, suggestions for the next uh, research. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Agita. And uh, you already introduced me. Yes, I'm from Wisdom University of Applied Science. I'm a researcher, and I will moderate the uh, next part, uh, panel discussion, and we will discuss about uh, sustainability and development of Baltic state uh, regions in past, uh, present, and in the future. I uh, will have excellent discussions in this uh, discussion, uh, and uh, uh, just from academic sector, uh, Zenonas Norcus, but, but just I will name you and then you will join after my slides. I will show some slides because I should somehow warm you and, and inform maybe what, what we already did yeah, in, in our project. Yeah, Maybe if it somehow will help to our discussion. So Zenonas Norcus, Williams University professor, then Olaf Mertelsmann, uh, Tartu University professor, historian. Uh, then uh, Agita Livinja, uh, professor with the University uh, of Applied Science, and then uh, two uh, very experienced people from, uh, I can say, from uh, modern policy, yeah, from, uh, they are from po politics, uh, Haris Rokpelnis, uh, member of Latvian parliament, uh, I hope, yeah, I, I can say so, because we need uh, new people in the European Parliament, yeah, yeah, that, so he's participating in elections, and former mayor of uh, Masala's municipality, yeah, and then uh, Yuris Puts, I see Yuris, hello, yeah, Yuris is here, yeah, uh, uh, member of the board of uh, Latvian Union uh, of Economists, former minister of uh, regional development, and environmental protection and uh, former state secretary of uh, minister of economics so i believe it will be interesting uh, discussion but i uh, let's start with some introduction slides i will just tell you a story about baltic 100 what we already did here yeah maybe it will help okay then uh, for i think yeah yeah this is name for discussion yeah and uh, but uh, yes uh, we can discuss more deep and maybe of course, in the same time, uh, we will discuss emotionally, but no, our discussions can be more based to date because in the last three years, we worked together, four institutions, three institutions from Baltic states and the Norwegian School of Economics in a field of economic history. And what we did, yeah, we, we, we really we coupled a lot of quantitative data about the social and economic transformation in regions, in national and regional level. Uh, about last hundred years, and uh, not only not only some uh, some uh, quantitative data, but we created this. Uh, we, what we did, we estimated GDP of Baltic uh, states in last hundred years, and not only national, but uh, for some of years in the regional level. So. It happened at first time, and not only this, yeah, and I'm very proud that not, we, we not uh, only did our estimations, but we created this database, uh, and, and this, uh, uh, this we already presented yesterday, but for everyone who is interested in our data, they can visit our database, yeah, and, and look to data, download data, and uh, we have not only this, but we have this data catalog, yeah, and uh, they are, uh, a lot of data about demography, about GDP, GDP calculations, employment, and uh, agriculture. Uh, more than uh, 100, yes, 102 data series, yeah, and so you can learn much more about Baltic states and Baltic states regions, yeah. And what is uh, one from our uh, innovation, what we did, uh, that uh, we prepared data, estimated regional data for these borders of current three regions. So if you have some historical data about this, 
uh, period uh, 100 years ago, you can compare what happened there. I can give just one example. Yeah, oh, this is, uh, I think, if we speak about calculations, this minor achievement of our uh, project. Uh, this is, uh, so we calculated this uh, estimated GDP per capita. Yeah, they are al already in Latvia, and yesterday there are a lot of discussions. Yeah, people look to this not only uh, like like uh, pragmatic, but emotionally. Yeah, how I remember yesterday, how you can show that we produced so much in Soviet economics, yeah, and in Soviet uh, occupation period, but it was true, yeah, and so, but it's excellent that uh, there are some emotions and so, but we not look to this Baltics not only to in national level, but we look to regional level, and this is one example about number of peaks, yeah, Latgala region, eastern part of Latvia, uh, we see that in region there are, of course, some gaps somewhere, yeah, we, we, we look to this 50s, 60s, yeah, we were not sure about these numbers, and then we allow to do this uh, for maybe uh, next projects, yeah, for, 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 for other scientists, yeah, but more or less we can see this picture, what happened, yeah, in Latgala, yeah, in Latgala, if you're writing some future development strategies, you can look to history to look, yeah, what happened there, yeah, and we see different trends, yeah, what happened in this, uh, this uh, 2030s of last century, then this very high jump yeah, over in this uh, Soviet occupation period. Because if we are in, in this, then of course we can find answers what happened. Of course, Latgala is Latgala, but you can compare yeah, different regions. This is an example of Latgala and Kurzem, yeah? eastern part, western part of Latvia. Of course, there are some similarities, yeah, if we, uh, if we speak about this period of 2030s of last, uh, of last century, but already in Soviet occupation period, we see there are some differences, yeah, and so what we can explain already, we see that this uh, rise number of peaks is very connected with how much uh, this region was uh, really connected with the Soviet economic system, yeah, and then so we know that it was supported, number of, of, of livestock was very uh, su su supported, this rise of this with this, uh, uh, this uh, import of this, uh, this food yeah, for, 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 for animals and so. And then, we, of course, we see what, what's happening in the last three decades. Yeah? Then we see that yeah, in Latgale numbers are already lower. And we can compare different countries. Yeah? The same, we can learn yeah, what happened in Estonia and Latvia. Yeah? And Estonians, uh, just one thing that I, I can say, that Estonians were uh, much more pragmatic in Soviet occupation, yeah, period they not use this, uh, this, this uh, Soviet, this uh, possibility to rise so much a number of, number of, number of peaks. And then we see that, that what happened in the 90s, yeah, this is jump, yeah, over, yeah, it was a much harder situation in Latvia. So a lot of things we can learn, yeah, from this, yeah, everyone, yeah, and, uh, of course, we have a lot of data, yeah, hundreds of, of data series, but now for me, myself, yeah, already I, I feel myself pretty emotional because I see that in the next uh, 10 years I have 100 ideas uh, for scientific publications and, and go deeper. Okay, uh, now uh, the, in details uh, already uh, I'm going to our discussion. So. What we learned from this project, and, and Zenonus uh, will go deeper in details, uh, what we learned, yeah, that always uh, there, were, there were differences, yeah, between, uh, between like capital cities, yeah, and regions, between different regions, and that's, this is what we learned from this uh, project. Uh, after estimations, for example, this historically, if we speak about Latvia, 2030s of, of, of last century, 100 years ago, it was more or less the same situation, yeah, that we see that the Riga, yeah, if we look to this uh, GDP per capita, yeah, f uh, region, uh, this national and this regional or, and city Riga, that Riga produced per capita twice so big uh, GDP than uh, Latvia in, 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 in general, yeah, and, and Latgale, yes, in the same, it, it was, yeah, it was the same, uh, story more or less uh, if we, we, we look to 21st century yeah that, that Latgala but but we see progress in Latgala yeah and so and uh, and uh, and uh, here we see already 21st century yeah and then more or less the same trend yeah Riga is is like leader of this yeah and challenge with other regions and uh, and so we can just say, yes, historically Riga was very big, yeah, center not only of Latvia, but, 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 but this region, yeah, and then Baltic Sea, and this explains somehow why Riga was all, always with such, uh, such high dominant, yeah, in, in, 
in, in, in Latvia, yeah, but but in the same time, yeah, we, we look that, that, for example, if we look to this Latgale, yeah, that no, yeah, uh, according our estimations, uh, Latgale is is worse situation how it was in 2030s, yeah, and this is something what we should think about. And uh, but it's not only one thing, yeah, but uh, but uh, when I when I, I will ask you questions and this discussion, but this is not okay. We look to this. This is GDP per capita, but really important part is the, in this uh, critical mass of people, yeah. And, and this is uh, what what we see it from other, yeah. If we estimating number of, of, of inhabitants in different regions, and here are very big changes, yeah. Amazing. If if you look to this, yeah, critical mass, for example, is the same Latgale, yeah. It was it was much more population in Latgale, yeah, in this time. And then, if you maybe this uh, GDP per capita is lower, but you can compensate with this critical mass, yeah. Now it's already totally different situation. And another, this blue, and we see what happened with our capital city Riga, yeah. Riga was not richer, yeah, uh, but Riga was much bigger. Riga grows in this time, yeah, and this is our problem, yeah, balance of those. Not only this, and only this peer Riga region, yeah, number of population rise in all. Other regions, border regions, I can say, there are borders, yeah, this uh, north of uh, Vidzeme and, and east, so Latgale, yeah, it's, it's depopulated, yeah, and what to do, what kind of solutions we can find for this, yeah, so this is another aspect, what we learn from this, yeah, so it's very challenging. And then, of course, uh, if we look, of course, we're, we're part of the uh, European Union, we celebrated 20 years, yeah, of this, yeah, NATO, European Union, but if you look to this European U Union rural vision, because situation is uh, the same if you look to some, uh, look what we count as rural regions, yeah, in, in, in different countries, including Latvia, then of course there are huge territories, yeah, a lot of uh, people, yeah, Valmir with 28,000, yeah, it's a rural area, yeah, and then uh, how all of all they say, if you have no cathedral, you're not city, yeah? you only town, yeah, and so, yeah, unfortunately, we have not cathedral, yeah, and so, so a lot of rural areas, yeah, in, in, in Europe, yeah, a lot of uh, uh, people, yeah, a lot of, lot of population uh, here, but, but what is really, and, and what do you, how Europe look to this, yeah, Europe look to this, of course, it's uh, perfect from, Strategic communication, this, but I, I name this like a fairy tale, yeah, so it's, it's promising, yeah, how we look to this uh, European regions and this countryside and uh, rural areas in Europe, but we look to them, they should be stronger, they will be stronger, they will be more connected, yeah, they will be more prosperous and resilient, yeah, perfectly fit, yeah, everyone of, of course is happy with this dream, but if we uh, look to reality, then for Latvian case, yeah, then, then we, what we see, Reduction number of schools, yeah, the population of this, yeah, this is aspect, yeah, and and other, of course, the number of people, yeah, and especially I, I already mentioned this in border regions, yeah, and we can speak not only of this region of uh, the border of Russia, but here in north of Latvia, yeah, that's, uh, that it's depopulated the regions already, yeah, and uh, what to do with this, yeah, and how to change these vectors, yeah, vectors of them future promises, future dreams with this reality, yeah, and if we see tractors in the streets and all over uh, Europe, then we can feel ourselves that something is, 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 is wrong here. So this was my introduction, uh, and uh, so I know I'm asking uh, panel discussants, yeah, I named you, please uh, take your seats here, yeah, and then we will start our discussion yeah, about this, yeah, please, yeah. Okay, uh, okay, uh, dear colleagues, uh, let's start our discussion. And uh, uh, first, I will give floor to Zenonas Norkus, yeah, professor of Vilnius University, because Zenonas, uh, you did so much research about regional development, and I already used your slides, yeah, about Latvia, but maybe you can say what you learned from this and just comments about this regional development, yeah, and everything, what happened in our regions, how you see the future. Yeah, floor is yours for your introduction part. Okay, thank you. Yeah, 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 it's, wo yeah, yeah. it's working. Uh, well, you know, uh, for me personally, this project uh, was uh, maybe more interesting uh, not by discoveries but by failures 
what we did learn about limits of well uh, methodologies which are well used for this uh, aim to estimate regional GDP. So we uh, just uh, did not invent uh, this methodology uh, which we have used. We just uh, did made copycat. There is well uh, established tradition of research on this regional GDP. Uh, well. Uh, which is well presided over by Nikolaus Wolf from Berlin University and Juan Roses from well, London School of Economy, Economy. And this is what we did is very well researched well for Western European countries starting with late 19th century. Uh, so we just uh, take over this methodology, look at for appropriate data, and uh, just did the same. And uh, well, uh, in uh, some well, cases we did succeed as well, just uh, I think 100%, and uh, well, this applies for interwar period. Well, partial exception, exception is, uh, well, Estonia, because we did receive data o only on uh, uh, very late stage, well, and, uh, well, did not have enough time to reflect over. So, with Estonia, uh, the problem was, uh, I think, that during interwar time, it was uh, one huge either Ida country in northeast with Narva. And now it's partitioned into uh, well two parts. There is smaller country, Ida Viru count, ca county with, uh, with Narva, and another half is joined to uh, this uh, new Nuts Free Kesk Esti. Kesk Esti. And this Kesk Esti also takes parts of territory from as uh, well interwar countries, and I assume it is very difficult to estimate well what numbers you should assign to this <coughs> diminished diminished well uh, uh, well <coughs> Viru county county, and how to well, uh, well derive figures figures from this new Kesk unit Kesk unit yes mm -hmm. yeah yeah the the problem is. Um, to assign population is simple, yeah? yeah? You, you know, 10% from there and 7% from, from there, but how do you assign um, <clears throat> industrial labor? So where are exactly the mines and the factories and so on? And, and this is pretty difficult. Uh, I couldn't do it. <laughs> yes, the problem is well, uh, it's not clear for, for me where those well oil shale well, uh, well production sites from the raw time. They where where they are now. They are now in Kesk, in Kesk ST or in this Edo Vera. And it depends very much on exit line. So well uh, I think we need some fine fine graining on, on this issue, but well otherwise we have uh well new results which show there was uh, uh not so good equality. At the beginning of independence, well this uh, well most rich Tallinn area, Hario County, only some twenty percent <laughs> over the, this uh, national mean then, and then the well, uh, growth of in inequality by, the, uh, by 1945, second census. But well, it's a bit suspicious about the, because of those, uh, being, uh, our results for this Iduviru region. Uh, 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 a, a, well, okay, so I think, well, uh, uh, it should be maybe a bit richer for 1934, but well, we we will uh, well work on this. Well, uh, well, uh, what what is about the well, Latvia? So Gatis already showed this. Only only well uh, <coughs> important and interesting point point well, we should well made this discovery 
while well, checking uh, official statistic data from post-communist period to uh, compile this database. Well, uh, as uh, earlier steps, initially, we started with data series for Latvia from 2000, using only Eurostat data. But, well, Jurgita was well, succeeded to find somewhere. They, uh, they are very good uh, in extracting some data, finding and extracting some data which are somewhere, you know, uh, archived somewhere in databases, not actual version. And so we uh, uh, now have uh, regional GDP, uh, well, serious for Latvia since 1995. And got this, you know, in 1995, Latgale wasn't most pure region. Guess what region was most pure in 1995? Wizzem. Yeah. Ah, you know. I know. Uh, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, we, we know yeah, how uh, yeah. about statistics and so. But, but I have this question about, about Riga. So Riga is something unique, yeah, if we look to Baltic states. What you can just uh, from your, no, if, if you look to the last 100 years, did Riga help? for regional development of Latvia, or not? Well, it's a it, factor of helping, uh, yeah, or, or not? Well, uh, well, no, it was not part of our agenda. We should look, should have data about redistribution. <laughs> you know, the balance. Who, who did pay more taxes? Taxes, well. And how those taxes were used? Well, I assume that, uh, and you know, there are direct taxes, indirect taxes, well, and so. And of course, in, in terrible time, well, Riga paid most direct taxes, direct taxes, well. And, well, uh, my, well, suspicion is, well, and it's not only my suspicion, it's what, uh, well, Arthur Seichner did right in interwar period. Uh, so Riga did help somewhat to, well, maintain infrastructure, and Lagal and so on, to finance, you know, this education, well, network, and so on. Uh, primary education schools and so on. So if you uh, work well on the transfer level, interregional, maybe Riga did help, did help well. well but uh, you know, th this was not part of our research. We just did not collect this data about taxation on transfers well. Uh, well, and what, what about Riga? Well, Riga uh, always was top, uh, but if you look, uh, Look, this long time series, you see that Riga was best, was best in good times. Then there were good times, and good times, well, then there was a lot of investments, well, the foreign capital did come to Riga, to Riga, well, because it was the best place, and of course people went to Riga, and Riga, well, got even more up. But in bad times, during the crises, crises, Riga suffered most. Those Riga numbers plummeted most, and those numbers of uh, not so well to do regions, including Latgale, they plummeted uh, less, less. So during crisis as well, uh, those pure regions did not fall so much as Riga, because when you're sitting at very low place, it is not, not much to fall there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Riga, Riga was factor why Estonians and Lithuanians were very skeptical 100 years ago to build some closer Baltic alliance because they said that then Latvians will dominate because of Riga. But Riga is like a tool uh, you, 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 you somehow uh, you need the skills uh, how to work with this tool because if I look how we managed to build now this Royal Baltic Railway, yeah, and, and, and Riga, yeah, and, and so, yeah, we, we did almost ev everything possible, yeah, <laughs> to not take in advantage that Riga is in the middle, yeah, here, yeah, but, but yeah, it's already a different story, but maybe we'll then pol politicians uh, will com comment this, yeah. But, but, but maybe I, I, uh, you can give, uh, yeah, I can give the word to this, uh, yeah, to, to Olaf and uh, about regional development and different uh, political systems. Uh, how, what do you think? It's very different, what we, we, we know, in general, three very big periods, of course, wars, yeah, this is first period of independence, yeah, then the Soviet occupation, and now this after restoration of our in independence. Uh, uh, w which system help more for this? It's a, of course provocative question, yeah. But but how you look at this regional development? Okay, if you 
<clears throat> if you want to take the example of Estonia and how political decision making um, influences regional development, then the case of uh, Itaviruma, uh, Eastern Veronia is uh, the best example, actually. Um, you have oil shale there. Oil shale can be proceeded to gasoline, to gas. You might even produce uh, uranium from oil shale. So in the interwar period, there was the idea, OK, we can use oil shale and g get a little bit independent from uh, certain imports, mainly coal. We want to replace coal and gasoline. And that's the, re the reason why, in the beginning of the 1920s, the region, Ida Viruma, was more or less like any other uh, rural region in the country. But uh, in the mid-1930s, showed already uh, strong development. But this political decision meant um, there were subsidies and, and protection by customs. So the taxpayer paid for this development. And oil shale is not sustainable from an ecological perspective. And some years later, Stalin detected Estonian oil shale and together with Molotov made a decision we, after the annexation of Estonia, we have to foster the Estonian oil shale basin and production should go up five, six times. So after the war, the first post-war plan, the five-year plan of reconstruction was implemented and nearly all investment in Soviet Estonia went to the Tallinn region and into the oil shale basin. And 40% of this investment was military investment because the biggest single investment was an uranium enrichment facility in the northeast. Silla now. In Silama. So it was for Stalin's nuclear bomb policy. Uh, the facility operated until 1991. Uh, so it was Stalin's decision, we have to develop this region. And because there was heavy fighting in World War II, and most of the people have left the region, it was repopulated mostly with Russian-speaking immigrants. And so it became the second re richest region uh, in Estonia based on an unsustainable development of the oil shale industry. Politicians can foster a uh, region and politicians can strip a region from support. And this is what happened in the 1990s when uh, oil shale production was reduced, subsidies were reduced. I think I still, I still pay for, <laughs> for oil shale support with my taxes, but not as much as previously. So this second most developed region, well, is nowadays the most problematic in the country. So it's, it's also political decisions. Yeah, yeah. And okay. history. Yeah. Yeah, 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 very interesting. And the same we can say, for example, this uh, Kurzem region in Latvia and Soviet occupation period. And of course, uh, they just made this like a close region, yeah, and, and it was limits to it, it's this. But uh, from other side, from in, uh, this uh, environmental protection perspective, if you look now, yeah, it was not so bad for this. Yeah, so always that, that the same we can say that, 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 uh, 
sometimes this uh, geopolitical uh, the geopolitical turbulence and then some changes yeah uh, in long term yeah perspective yeah help us somehow yeah to do something of course this is provocative yeah but 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 sometimes the same is with the riga yeah carl sulmans had dreamed to remove all uh, German architecture and build modern Latvian buildings, yeah, and because of Soviet occupation, yeah, we can say, yeah, then women did achieve this, yeah, so it's a paradox, yeah, of history that sometimes, yeah, somehow we, <laughs> some long term, yeah, we, we know how this German architecture. Uh, okay, but uh, with my example, the Nava region, um, take this Nowadays, less than 5,000 persons out of a workforce of 700,000 are employed in the oil shale industry. But more than half of the ecological footprint of Estonia is produced by the oil shale industry. So less than 1% of the workforce for each person working in oil shale, you have a more than 50 times bigger ecological footprint than for any other uh, sector of the economy. Okay, yeah, for me, I can say good news because if you will start uh, estimations of Soviet laws, yeah, this is a one from factors, what we can do. I, I lead this commission now in Latvia and, and we can make this together and then uh, we, if it was decision of Molotov and Stalin perfectly fit for us, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work like this. Um, I'm a member of the same commission in Estonia and at first we, we had a long talk with a lawyer and Things like uh, things like uh, wrong decisions in uh, industrial policy, they do not fit into compensation. You just you just have the hard convention on occupation, and and then you have private law, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This we, we can we'll discuss later. But Agita, Agita, please. Uh, I know that Agita visited almost all countries in the world, and and and, and you know you you learned a lot of different regions in the world. But uh, but I, it, it was like my question. But I know you prepared some slides. You have some introduction or, or some feedback from what we discussed already. You have some slides. Yes. You want to show yes, them? Yes, but I have slides about the cities in, in the context of uh, special development of the country, but I think that uh, I will keep uh, later my slides. Uh, but yeah. if the question about uh, what we can uh, take and bring uh, from uh, other countries, at first uh, I would like to mention that a broader perspective enable a more objective assessment of the situation, uh, that this is very important. And the second, uh, which I would like uh, to highlight based on my experience, that it's very important how uh, every one of us are introducing uh, uh, with our uh, country uh, foreigners. Uh, from my experience, uh, when I uh, studied in, uh, in the States and in uh, India, I uh, understood that if, we, uh, if I want uh, to provide some input uh, for uh, my country, uh, then uh, I will start uh, my introduction that I am from Europe, because it helps uh, people uh, to uh, recognize and uh, it simplifies the knowledge where I am from, that I am from Europe. And then I can start to say that I am uh, from uh, Latvia. If I will say just I am from Latvia, okay, he say, oh yeah, great, and it's, it's fine. <laughs> uh, Sounds and, good, yeah. Uh, I will not uh, get uh, any uh, feedback uh, from this uh, discussion, uh, but uh, I think it's important how we are thinking, what we would like uh, uh, to reach. And uh, also, uh, the, uh, another point, it's important if we are comparing something then uh, why we are doing and in uh, what kind, uh, what, what's the reason. And uh, 15 uh, years ago, uh, I visited Gambia. And uh, it uh, gave me a very uh, hard uh, uh, footprint. <laughs> 
if I can say in, in such a words, when I saw that the local people uh, in the market bought only a handful of rice for the family. And uh, then you are starting to compare uh, the situation in Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, and in part of uh, Africa. Or another example, uh, many uh, of uh, our uh, inhabitants are not so satisfied with the quality of the roads, with the traffic. But there are many countries when you need three or four hours uh, to reach 100 kilometers. But of course, at the same time, we can compare that maybe a high-speed uh, train uh, uh, will uh, complete the distance in uh, some uh, 20 or uh, 30 minutes. Yes, uh, I think that uh, in my uh, mind, uh, Latvia and also Estonia, Lithuania, are, uh, we have uh, very good conditions uh, for the living and for developing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, of course. And you should visit really different countries in all the world, yeah, and in Asia and South America and Africa, and then you can learn this, yeah. But of course, our expectations, because only some a couple of hundred kilometers here, yeah, we can visit yeah, different other countries and look yeah, to development there. And of course, it's very connected what happened in the last uh, hundred years uh, with, with our countries. We already discussed this yesterday, that potentially without this geopolitical catastrophes in Latvia uh, will be today about five million uh, inhabitants, yeah, and, and, and from them uh, at least four million Latvians, yes, yeah, so like, and, and so, uh, it's a reality, yeah, it's a reality, but at the same time, if we look uh, to this uh, a little bit more philosophically, then, then of course, our footprint to this, yeah, maybe it's good, yeah, in general for uh, our planet that we have less population now in Latvia than we had in the beginning of the 20th century, yeah, and then the same we can uh, say about number of uh, industries, number of, 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 of peaks, yeah, or our cattle, and, and, and so. But, okay, Agita, you're sitting between two politicians, yeah, and, uh, yeah, 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 a perfect place, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, and uh, yes, and then uh, both of them were involved in, uh, uh, in the political decisions and, and uh, in reforms in Latvia in last decade, in uh, five years ago, and uh, Yuri Sputz, uh, already before elections promised that he will initiate this uh, administrative regional reform and in the same time uh, this uh, Harris uh, you were this uh, uh, mayor of municipality yeah and and, and because of uh, this uh, reform uh, because you really lost your municipality yeah and yeah yeah and then so and uh, of course it's a bit provocative but maybe this was so, because of that, we have now one very active member of Latvian Parliament, yeah? And perhaps we, had, we, we will oh, yes. have one very, very <laughs> active <laughs> member of European Parliament, yeah? But uh, just maybe uh, I will give a word to you. You can comment, yeah? What do you think about this regional development, about what you learned, yeah, to be this head of municipality you now in the Latvian Parliament? And yeah, you can use this maybe for elections. Yeah, what, what you, what? Yeah, both of you, both of you can use this. Why not? Because uh, our uh, public uh, broadcast uh, will is not streaming us because they said that no, it's dangerous for us. Two persons yeah, participating in elections and so yeah, and then, and so I, I try to discuss with them. But okay, yeah, okay, yeah. For us, it was much more important have both of you here for discussion. Yeah, but but Harris, yes, no. Uh, your perspective of this yeah, question of regional development and <laughs> first of all thank you for inviting me to this panel um, it's it's an honor and it's really nice to have scientists and politicians but I think we uh, if we talk about regional development we lack one um, important player here and it's entrepreneurs um, and, and regarding what, uh, how politics can can affect and influence uh, regional development uh, uh, election is coming and, and every politician will say we can do everything and we will do everything. Um, and also society often expects uh, that politicians will change things for the better, like dramatically. Um, on the other hand, um, when, when we looked at the data uh, you showed previously, um, 
the growth of GDP was fairly constant, uh, both in the years of occupation and now, okay, the, the speed of growth was higher now, but more or less the growth was there. Also, you showed uh, the data uh, where there's the um, uh, GDP, uh, GDP in regions as a percentage of, of the total GDP of the country. And, and when you looked at, on, the, um, on the period of the 1930s, um, and, uh, and in the period of nowadays, actually the comparative um, differences between regions and the capital have not changed much. So does policy affect regional development at all? <laughs> and and um, I think we should set some ground rules in this one. So um, actually, uh, I have a strong belief that uh, regarding these issues, especially in democracy, uh, policy cannot affect much. What, what politicians can do, they can make the lives of the people better. But uh, as, as a growth, as a GDP, not that much. Of course, there are examples, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, for the oil shell or, or, uh, or um, decision, let's say, okay, now, now there's a politi political decision, let's, let's uh, focus on growing pigs, for example, or, or, or we can make a political decision, we see that there's a problem with depopulation, let's make a pol political decision that, uh, that uh, people cannot uh, use uh, tractors stronger than 80 horsepower for, for getting their harvest. So you will need more people on the fields, so, so there will be more people living in the regions. That, that's an option, in a sense. But uh, um, it will stop the population. Will it increase uh, productivity? Most likely not. Um, so there's a, there is this sort of dilemma in, in this aspect. Um, I believe that public sector, in a sense, of course, is responsible for for growth, for for uh, development, also regional development. But um, in in general, public sector, in theory. Uh, is not uh, responsible uh, it in a direct way. Uh, what public sector should do is, is uh, work uh, or, or counteract uh, potential crisis, uh, slow down some natural effects like, let's say, uh, depopulation. That's the, that's the job of the public sector to countermeasure, to take countermeasures to this problem so that uh, the free market is, is too wild and so that it, it wouldn't make everything collapse. Um, what we can do, we can, uh, we can make uh, policies on, on, uh, on let's say, education, uh, uh, mobility and so on, but the public sector will not stop the world from spinning. Um, so we are limited in, into how, how we can um, improve or, or uh, uh, let's say, uh, regional development. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I remember two years ago you used this uh, example of where this uh, village uh, uh, in our documentary and uh, there are no people more, yeah, and theoretically it was possible with some actions, political actions, to keep people there or not, or it's just general trend. Well, I, I represent a party that's like mainly based in regions, and what I'm going to say now is is not going to sound good for me. <laughs> but um, uh, the the case with Versis village, uh, it's um, it, it, what what public sector can do in those cases is sort of take a palliative care, basically uh, make the end um, nicer. Yeah, yeah. It was idea to pay like salaries for people who really agree to stay in countryside. Maybe some rich countries can do this, but uh, if we speak about sustainability, yeah, but but uh, okay. But, but, well, let's let's not make it so so grim. Um, all in all, um, this uh, when when what I was talking about is basically GDP growth and and like this material development, but. Uh, we know that country, uh, nation is something more than just GDP. And, uh, and it's also our culture, or, uh, which is often like the, the song and dance festival. You know, it's, it's basically it's rooting from the regions. So, so if we want that to be here, if we want to stay Latvians, uh, Lithuanians and Estonians as we are, 
we have to take care of that heritage. And, um, and, and the, here policy plays quite a high role. Um, also, uh, Europe in general says that we, we need cohesion. We need to support uh, the regions that are weaker. And I just, I just uh, sometimes there's, uh, again, a contradiction. In the European level, we, th we say that uh, Latvia is, uh, and, and the Baltic states in general are the border area. Uh, we are a bit underdeveloped compared to the average of the EU, so we need more supports to catch up. And then when those planning documents and, the, and, and finances uh, come to our national level, then we sort of forget that that Latvia as well is, is built just like Europe. We have the, the richer center and, and then the regions. So these are the policies that again affect it, but uh, will they play uh, a sort of distinctive role? Will, will there be a boom in development because of these policies? I think not. Okay, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, yes, I would like uh, to add one note about the uh, public sector. In my mind, uh, there are uh, many cases when a uh, public sector is going in uh, uh, providing uh, services and uh, goods for society, which can be uh, provided by the private sector, by the private business. And this is a problem not only for the rural areas, but also for the cities. And this destroys this uh, business environment uh, and competition uh, for the private sector. Uh, the public sector has a huge influence on economic development, an enormous influence um, in the form of institutions. Institutions matter, institutions are the rules of the game, you need laws, regulations and so on. And the, a good example uh, is the development in the Baltic states over the last 35 years, which country made the quickest reform and built up the qu the quick, uh, in the quickest possible way um, efficient institutions. Yeah? And from our data you see that Estonia in the 1990s was number one. And they were number one not because Estonians work harder, or because our song festival is better. No, no, not. <laughs> it's not better, <laughs> but, but because, because Estonian politicians made a decision to have the reform as quick as possible and to establish efficient institutions as quick as possible while the whole process in Latvia and Lithuania lacked temporarily behind. And later, Lithuania took, took over. Yeah? But, but politicians are responsible for efficient institutions. I, I totally agree with you, definitely. Uh, uh, but uh, th th I have heard uh, numerous theories of, of uh, what happened to the Baltic states. And and uh, do you have any data that supports uh, your uh, uh, claim at the moment? If, if you go through the standard literature on transition, you will figure out that initially there were two parties, uh, a slow tra transition and a, a quick transition and institution building. Uh, later, later on, the countries who uh, it came became very clear, the countries who transformed the fastest and built up democratic and efficient institutions the quickest, having the lowest corruption, etc., were the most successful in the transition period, and 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 this is agreed in in the literature. You you might start with uh, Anders Orslund and others. Yeah. And what's happening now in the 1920, uh, in the 2020s to Estonia then in that case? <laughs> I better do not comment <laughs> on, on our stupid governments of the last years. They are really stupid. <laughs> okay, 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 Joris, uh, Joris. Uh, yeah, we already started discussion in uh, several directions, but yes, uh, 
what do you think about this and can we really influence some trends, global trends with some initiatives, with some governmental initiatives, with some reform, something like that, or this is just a reaction, yeah, for we just reacting to something what will happen, yeah, and then and we can just make this a bit slower or so. But what do you think? Uh, what do you think yeah, about this what regional development and, and reform? Maybe you can grade or this previous uh, regional administered reform if you were to ten, yeah, how you can grade this and yeah. <laughs> Floor is yours now. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me, and it's a very uh, marvelous discussion, and being the, the, the last one is even more marvelous. You, you can listen to everybody else and then respond to them, not thinking about what you actually wanted to say. Uh, I'm not a history scholar. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm really much like history. I have uh, read a lot about it, and, and uh, I know about uh, Latvian economic history from the books of Edmund Krastinch and uh, Gatis Krumic and uh, Ivar Strang, who is not here. And, and I, 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 but I'm not read the things that uh, you have all read, and I don't know all the data. So uh, in general, I, I, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a politician. I'm not running an election. So you will not be able to vote me for in, in eight, uh, June uh, of eighth of June, but in general, uh, uh, as a politician, I'm, uh, uh, I uh, consider myself uh, uh, as uh, as you get, had a good example. There is always in every single uh, multi-party uh, political system there are actually two major parties, all of them grouped in two groups. Uh, one of them is uh, called Move Faster, the other one is called Move Slower. And uh, I have always been in a group Move Faster. Uh, that's a fact, Move Faster. Uh, and uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a fact in the 90s and also in 2020s and also in 1920s. But if the system, when the system, uh, political system is young, it's much uh, easier for a group move faster uh, to gain uh, upper hand and say we should move faster because we had very huge problems. If there are huge problems, you can always say you need move faster, otherwise you die. If everything is more or less, then move slower gains the upper hand. It always happens in every single political system, democratic political system. So we need some deep crisis now for we have faster. had We have had uh, not one uh, over time and always when the, uh, when the crisis comes uh, we, we move faster. Uh, I would my, myself personally uh, believe that it's necessary to move faster even there are no crises. But unfortunately, not, not unfortunately, <coughs> fortunately all the people have to decide on that, and if people don't want to move faster, that's their right. That's their right, not to move faster, move slower. That's their right, and they can decide and take a decision, move slower uh, in general. And in that, se in that sentence, whether it is possible in general trend, the general trend is, is uh, if you look all over OECD, a lot of data on regional imbalances, over, I don't know, 100 years ago there were no OECD data, 100 years ago. Uh, maybe there will be if you continue working, broaden the scope. How are these to estimate yeah, 19th the century? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but in general, in general there are a lot of data, for, especially for the last 30 years on, on, on regional development. And if you look at the old OECD countries, almost in every, almost in every single country, the regional disparities have grown have grown. There are multiple reasons why there are a lot of literature on that, that I have studied, a lot of literature on that, and this is an uh, area where there are underlying trends that uh, said that, and Harris mentioned it quite well, there are uh, the traditional industries like agriculture, forestry, they require much less human labor as it used to require because of technological advances. You cannot turn back time and say uh, you will plow the uh, land by uh, 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 horse and uh, then we will get back people. We will not get back people because they will receive very small salaries if they will plow by, by horse. You need to go uh, uh, with the technological advances, but it brings the, the necessity of much less people in traditional industries. So, and the regions have much, li uh, very small limited availability to replace this uh, uh, employment. For example, to set the, uh, like, like uh, manufacturing without the help of central government. The central government plays an enormous role in that, 
when they, and there are a couple of countries who have succeeded to diminish this. For example, Finland. Finland is one of the few countries in the world that has diminished regional disparities. They have done it by a very uh, big central government investment, setting strategies for every single big region, not uh, 100 regions, but four, setting strategies for every region, concentrating resources, and investing. But there are a lot of literature on Finnish economy who say this policy has limited the growth. There is smaller regional disparities, but overall growth of Finnish economy because of that has been smaller if it had not been that kind of investment. This is a choice every single country should make. Do we see? Because if you take, uh, uh, there is always, uh, investment has opportunities. Public investment, if you took an infrastructure, there's m that's not so calculated many times. But you can take a uh, uh, calculation and say whether it is more good to invest, for example, in public hospital in Riga or in Valmiera. And you can very precisely calculate the economic effects of that. But they are not only economic effects for public investment. For private investment, it's always only economic effect, uh, effects at place. So you either subsidize the choice by a central government means, or you will actually go with the flow, and the money will flow where the biggest returns are. That's always so. The, the private investor wants to make money. You can make it, you can do it anywhere. So the, this, is a, this is a choice. This is a choice. But in general, we should understand that will, it will at some point limit the growth if we make a choice. If you make a smart choice, the limits can be very small. For example, if we understand what are the uh, strategic uh, uh, edges of competitiveness for each of the region. And it's not, um, uh, for Latvia's case, very much a well-educated regional workforce. It's not a case. We should be clear about that. It's not a case of, of uh, very well overdeveloped public infrastructure. So we should find uh, 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 competitive advantages for each of the region in Latvia's case, most probably five, and concentrate the investment in the right decision. We will diminish the, uh, or the minimize the effects that these underlying currents will have, whether we'll be able to overturn it and minimize the uh, increase of, uh, of uh, regional disparities. That's a very hard uh, question to answer. Okay, definitely politics cannot um, stop ongoing trends, and urbanization is a general trend, and so on. But when it comes to regional development, uh, there is a nice example from the Soviet period. Um, the collective farms in the 1960s, and especially in the 1970s, uh, could act more freely than state enterprises mm -hmm. because they were a collective enterprise. Um, so they started to work in construction mm -hmm. and they started to build up collective farm industries. Uh, and one reason was that agriculture became a little bit more efficient and you you also well you keep your people busy by this, but collective collective construction in Estonia uh, led to the most interesting construction projects. If if uh, historians of architecture are searching for the pearls of mm. Soviet architecture, mm -hmm. it's mostly collective farm construction. It's, 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 it's really funny. And those collective farm uh, small industries also were relatively successful. The interesting thing is in some villages, the remains of collective farm industry 
are still operating with a new owner and they are successful. So my wife is working in such, a, in, in such an enterprise which somehow dates back to, to collective farm industry. And small industry in the countryside has an advantage. Workforce might be paid a little bit less because the cost of living is much lower, etc. Or if they got equal pay, they can buy themselves a house instead of living in a flat and things like that. So maybe with some tax advantages, if you settle down your production line, uh, not in the outskirts of Riga, but nearby Valmira. If I may add, I think the, the, uh, uh, the, the, in every single strategy, the first thing that you should always do is uh, think about uh, what you can keep from that that you already have. There are a lot of actually, in, in Latvian rule, if you look at, for example, manufacturing these days in Latvia, there are a lot of very competitive, highly exporting uh, companies which are situated in rural areas, if you look in the great, not in Riga, let's say that, yeah. And for that purpose, uh, you should concentrate on what is important for them, for them to be competitive. Uh, not, uh, it not, in most instances, it doesn't mean directly subsidizing. Uh, I have talked to the uh, regional entrepreneurs for many years and they have always changed what they want. <laughs> At times go by and say, for the last uh, five to six years, the major issue they always say is workforce, availability of workforce. That's a major issue that they have, especially if you have a uh, relatively uh, high value production there. You need to have a, a skilled labor, and the problem of skilled labor is not only in, in, in rural areas, all over Latvia, but in general, the, in rural areas, concentrates more. The problem is bigger. But they get by, and, uh, and you should concentrate on them and, and, uh, and uh, help them achieving those, the, the things that they la lack because of the fact that they are regionally based that they would never uh, lack if they would be, for example, in Riga. And the skilled workforce is one good example. That means, for example, concentrating on education availability, uh, especially uh, vocational education availability, which is very important for man manufacturing, which is a very good way to keep uh, a sustainable way of regional development. Because manufacturing enterprises, they need to compete on global scale. Ev even if they sell everything in Latvia, they still have competitors from all over the world coming to your country and selling the same goods. And if they need to be competitive, they need to be com competitive globally, or at least regionally, meaning not regionally with them, but regionally like uh, northern part of Europe. And for that purpose, it's much more sustainable than for example, uh, having a, a big number of public sector subsidized jobs, which is a not sustainable solution. What will happen with those jobs if the money dries up, uh, which has happened in Latvia for many times and happen, will happen again, uh, because we have right now a large number of uh, uh, not really uh, sustainable public sector jobs with, with very low uh, pay but large number of employment, yeah? And this is, a, this is a, an, an issue that, uh, that, uh, that, that's good, to concentrate on those who already work there. That's like uh, if you work with, uh, with, with uh, uh, how to attract investment to your country. The best way is to start with those who have already invested in your country. You will get 80% of return from them because they already know you, they know the regulation, they have a management team there, they don't need to invent that. If you, you will spend 80% of resources on, on attracting new ones, but to gain only 20% of return, concentrate on those who are already working here, and they will get the biggest, uh, best results. Okay, we can slowly move our discussion to this future part. And uh, what we can learn from history, we had in the Baltics, and especially in Latvia, in 100 years, uh, several waves of migration. Uh, people immigrated from Latvia, like refugees in war situations, but then because of economic conditions, uh, they came back here. We know the Soviet occupation period, uh, huge immigration here from Soviet Union. Then people moved uh, 
uh, to these European rich countries, yeah, Estonians to Finland, yeah, Latvians to Ireland and other countries, and, and uh, Lithuanians uh, to Germany and other countries. And maybe this can be one from theoretical solution for future, because everyone, uh, if we look to future and say about Latvia, because of climate change, so climate will be better, it will be perfect place where to stay, yeah, it's democracy, uh, yeah, we try to allow people do more things than in other countries, yeah, and uh, we will be maybe not so uh, fast how our ambitions, we will always be richer, 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 and maybe we can just open our borders, yeah, but of course, then, of course, it's another thing, yeah, but I learned from uh, my village, uh, Ladurg, that it was factory some years ago, and then uh, they attracted 30 people from, uh, uh, from, uh, it was from uh, Vietnam, yeah, and it changed environment very significantly because from one side, of course, everyone was happy that something is happening there, yeah, another, yeah, you, 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 uh, yeah. you, you, you can see them, yeah, in environment and then and, and people are confused, yes, partly, yeah, and it was a totally different situation. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, you are already ready to comment this about this migration, like because we know in Latvia, a lot of people in Soviet occupation period moved from Latgale to Vidzem, yeah, and and so people just uh, moving, yeah, and then they able to do this, and and only reason why Latvians uh, didn't emigrate from Latvia in Soviet occupation period, the borders were closed, yeah, and that just was a reaction. Now, yeah, but what do you think about this? Yeah, did you try maybe in uh, muscle at this? <laughs> Um, so, uh, again, uh, what you said, th those are facts and not true, but uh, it's, it's sort of getting a bit political at the moment. Um, so, um, yes, we are not going to escape the, the climate change. We are, the the uh, movement of people will be higher uh, in most likely the upcoming decades. And, um, well... Uh, then, then I'm more of a uh, of that political side that that wants to go slow and and so on and uh, um, so uh, I would I would look really carefully on that because also from what you just mentioned, what we need in the workforce, we need skilled, motivated, educated uh, people who are uh, running uh, from droth. Uh, or, or storms or whatever, most likely only a s small percentage of that will be the the ones that we are looking for, actually. But uh, but uh, as I heard uh, from 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 Yuri's perspective, most likely he said, Let, let's let's get ahead of time and uh, and open the gates and and bring them here before the problem starts. Or so um, I would I would be really careful with that. I said that we we have to prepare. We have to be ready for that. It's, it's, uh, it's a fact. It will happen. We have to be ready for that and we have to use this time to prepare. The same as we are now preparing on our borders. Uh, God knows what can happen. We have to get ready. That's the same issue. We have to get ready, um, uh, educate ourselves, uh, educate uh, our children, uh, uh, put some potential systems in place, but... Uh, but uh, we still have to be a bit careful because, as you said, locals might not be as uh, as open to these ideas uh, momentarily. So it it takes time. So I, the the question, the big question is: we want to be rich or we want to be happy? Because most likely, as a society, we won't get both. Yeah. Uh, well, God's question was: what we can learn from history about future. Well, I think uh, my observation may be relevant. So among those uh, former communist regimes, so East German was more stable in the sense there uh, was least inside internal opposition. And one of those, uh, uh, all communist regimes, one of them uh, is surviving still in Cuba. What, why Cuban regime is so, so stable? So in both cases, the reason is that uh, well, uh, uh, dissidents can emigrate mm -hmm. uh, from Cuba. There are not many dissidents well, in Cuba. Dissidents are in Miami, mm -hmm. in Miami, and prospering. And well, people from Eastern Germany 
who wanted well, better life, they did manage to emigrate despite Berlin Wall. wall. So I think that, uh, well, in, well, uh, assumption is that if uh, Putin's regime will not collapse, if not collapse, if will to collapse and Russia will fragment and so on, so what I will say now doesn't apply. But if will not collapse, I think our prospect, we will become Baltic countries, Miami. Miami from opposition, for, for dissidents, dissidents from the, uh, well, Belarus, Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine. Ukraine is a specific case. There is war borders for men are closed and so on, but when people get opportunity to, to get somewhere to the east, they will come here. We have all the, those experiences in Lithuania. Well, when this uh, last election, well, in Belarus was, well, well, there was very, a lot of goodwill on part of the Lithuanian government to help this opposition. So borders were opened for all. Welcome to Vilnius. Now we have a huge Belarusian colony in Vilnius, some hundred thousand, thousand, well. And you know, you know it's, 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 in one sense, it's good, you know, good. Many of them are educated. Well, they have skills in international technologies and so on. There are Belarusian firms uh, registered, uh, not in Russia now, of course, and so on. But there are also, well, uh, political problems because they say, you know, well, Vilnius, Vilna Russia. Vilna Russia, but it's specific, uh, you know, because of this, those, uh, uh, well, uh, Lithuanian and Russian relations, but, well, uh, my impression is that, uh, that, you know, people who will not want to live under this Putin regimes, and there is really a lot of people who would want to stay in, in Russia, and they will use some better place, they maybe will come here, and they will have this educated, good, well-motivated force, but again, it was Slavonic, Slavonic workforce, and we will have, again, the irony of history. So we will escape from this empire, well, to, to, to remain with our cultures, clean and so on. Do not have this immigration, immigration, well, but nevertheless, we will have it again. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, but what uh, mentioned one from our demographs uh, expert, uh, Ilmar Smeshe, he always said that we will not reproduce ourselves, then our nation, somebody else, will sooner or later replace in our territory. So, and, and, and uh, yes, because it's not a very bad, it, it's a good place where to stay, where to live, yeah, and, 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 and be happy, yeah, and, and yeah, it's just our decision. And there are a lot of, of course, discussions, uh, and yesterday, that we should support somehow new families and so on, if they will be available to, to, uh, to, to, to have some uh, floods and something like that. And, 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 but uh, history teach, for example, in, in uh, when we, really raised this, this uh, quality of life in Latgale, then uh, significantly decreased number of children there. Yeah? So it's, yeah, it's like a paradox. You can pay, but you cannot buy children. Yeah? Because they are, uh, in, in a rich society, there are different alternatives, what to do. So I think that it's not only about money, it's about mindset, about everything, yeah, about this uh, value system, what we have, because there are different choices. Yeah? No, okay, we can pay for this. Yeah? Somebody maybe will yeah, we follow this uh, action, yeah? <laughs> and, and so, but, but somebody not. Yeah. Uh, okay, but uh, oh, oh, it's uh, maybe is some comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some uh, comment or uh, question. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question to Zenonis Norkus, but before a uh, very short advertisement. Last year, I wrote essay uh, why Latvia cannot do better, where I analyze the situation you briefly touched. Uh, available in English on Economist Association. Uh, homepage. But question to Zenonas Norkus is, uh, did you have uh, some difficulties uh, uh, putting together data for Lithuan Lithuanian regions? I mean, Klaipeda and Vilnius, and what kind? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you for this question. Well, well it's a very interesting issue. 
I would start to begin, you know, uh, we had an interwar well, uh, well, Lithuania, a kind of Latgale problem, but with opposite sign. sign. Our Latgale was in the West, and it was Memmerland. Memmerland. Yeah. In, well, Latvia, well, uh, Latgale Catholic and underdeveloped. In, well, Lithuania, this Western Lithuania, Klaipeda, Klaipeda, two times more developed than uh, remaining Lithuania and Protestant, Protestant, well, and looking to Germany then. And uh, Lithuania did fail, did work it a lot to integrate this own Latgale, good Latgale, yeah. super good Latgale, <laughs> but failed well. <laughs> and I think uh, Latvia was more successful in, uh, than, uh, in integrating uh, this real bad, bad Latgale. Yeah. Well, so so uh, uh, there was one problem uh, with well, integrated statistics of this Western part, but this relates only well for years well before and after after well inclusion of Klaipeda for uh, the period uh, when Klaipeda uh, belonged belonged to Lithuania 19. 1923-1939, it was uh, not really complicated, but well, really challenge was well, uh, the m movements of well, uh, Eastern border. So as everybody knows, Vilnius, well, and currently well, capital and most prospering region, Lithuania, well, did not uh, well uh, belong to well, uh, Lithuania and uh, Actually, we were not able to separate in Polish statistics well data uh, for this period well for, for the territory which belongs to Lithuania. So our calculations for interwar period only are for Lithuania uh, well in uh, interwar borders. But then we had cross time comparability problem. Well, because you have the smaller Lithuania without Vilnius, and you have contemporary Lithuania, this Vilnius. And so we were just blessed by the well, success of the uh, Lithuanian government in lobbying in Brussels to divide the, uh, Lithuania into two Nats two regions. Really, we work at on Nats three regions level, then in uh, Latvia, yeah, five, we have two times more. Well, well but, but you know, uh, well, and uh, just it so happened that uh, by this decision, well, we have now uh, one, most, uh, one region, Western and Central Lithuania, and uh, capital, uh, capital region, capital region, Vilnius region. And well, you know, more or less, more or less, the territory, well, not outline, but well, uh, area, area in uh, quadratic kilometers coincides perfectly of this, uh, well, Vilnius region, contemporary, this interwar time, well, Vilnius region. I mean the part of contemporary territory which was within Polish rules. So we just uh, could make comparison between interwar Lithuania, interwar Lithuania and this contemporary region, region Western and Central Lithuania, this Vilnius. And uh, next, uh, without Vilnius and with Vilnius. So it w we get uh, a possibility to use some kind of national experiment. So one with Vilnius and without Vilnius. And for Lithuania, we provide well, two versions of, of well, uh, analysis, comparing interval Lithuania with com complete contemporary Lithuania and with Lithuania without Vilnius. An interesting discovery is that uh, for this Lithuania without Vilnius, without Vilnius, so for this uh, Muswa region, Central Western region, inequality remain nearly on the same level, like inter like interwar time. Just so positions of leaders did change. Interwar time, interestingly, most rich was Shaulai region. Now it's more bordering Latvia. Yeah, bordering Latvia. Uh, yeah, not counting, of, of course, Klaipeda. Of course, yes, Klaipeda. Klaipeda was first, then Shaulai, then Kaunas. During the, well, first post-communist decades, decades, well, uh, Klaipeda was the first, 
then was Kaunas, and then Shulei was very, very somewhere below, below. And only some five years ago, in this area, in this area, Kaunas did overtake Lepida, Lepida. But this is the relations within this Western Central Lithuania, comparable uh, by territory with Turbo Lithuania. But of course, if you take complete Lithuania, Vilnius is always on the top, and uh, uh, contemporary inequalities in Lithuania on national level, uh, they accounted mostly by this prosperity of Vilnius region, by this gap between Vilnius and the rest. But, but this disparity is not so large as between Riga and the rest. Yeah. So much. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. So, okay, my last question to all of you because I really hope that somebody will watch this video in 2050. And my question is, uh, what will be, yeah, what will be different in the 2050 in uh, in uh, Baltic state regions? If we just, it will, of course, I, I believe in scientists. Yeah, they will uh, this uh, create some this. Uh, uh, time travel machine, and then if if we, for example, our panel, we jump to 2050, what will surprise us? Start with you. Historians are always bad looking <laughs> into the future, <clears throat> because you can only learn about history and not directly from history. 2050, um, I would guess urbanization on one hand continues, so more regions will be empty. And on the other hand, because of home office, etc., uh, some regions will fill up with people again. Maybe um, coastal regions, because of the higher quality of life. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I'm bad in future prognosis. Uh, well, actually, I already thought something about this question. So I think if this uh, current war in Ukraine will go on and escalate, uh, it, it, will, it will boost the integration of European Union. So we will have United States of Europe, not so very in very long time, but all, but maybe only in 2050. 50, we already have will have United States of Europe, and in those United States of Europe, both it will be a kind of Miami. Miami from those immigrants from, well, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and so on. Well, but this only my personal opinion. <laughs> and officially, I should tell them that uh, in uh, December last year, our government just accepted official strategy, Lithuania 2050. Okay. And I just, uh, as Lithuanian citizen, I'm sending an obligation report that according to older to Lithuania 2030 strategy, I know you also have Latvia 2030, we should depend to the first ten, first ten of wealth in Europe, in Europe. And according to new strategy 2050, we should be among the first five. First five. This is so official. This is a very old strategy. <laughs> we were told this already 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, uh, that's the thing. Uh, uh, 2050, it's the uh, uh, same distance in time as uh, year 2000 from now. And, and that's a time that I can actually remember. Um, so uh, mm, I think that not much will have changed. That will be the surprising that we are more or less the same. Uh, yes, in, in the graphs of GDP, uh, there will be the three Baltic states, maybe Latvia will, will be on top at that point for a brief moment. Uh, who knows? You know, we have wonderful politicians, <laughs> but uh, more or less, not much will have changed. We will still have the population, the, the, the massive migration uh, uh, will not have started yet. Probably there will be some signs, uh, or the, uh, I mean the climate migration. The economic migration, uh, the, the migration uh, from, from war, yes, that will 
be to some extent, but uh, but not significant. Um, so more or less, we'll be discussing the same problems, facing the same issues, uh, uh, maybe in a bit warmer room. Number five, uh, t uh, number ten in Europe. Some ambitions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, and we should just uh, uh, take in Europe some poor countries. Uh, okay, Turkey, for example, and then we will uh, achieve already this middle. Luxembourg in Germany goes away. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Agit. Okay. Uh, I uh, hope and I wish that in uh, 2050 uh, we will have uh, multicultural teams, not only in research projects but also in business, uh, because uh, multicultural uh, teams are uh, providing, uh, they are working more productive, and they are developing more innovations. And I hope that uh, we will go up in the index of uh, innovation, uh, innovative uh, cities and countries. I think in terms of, of economic uh, development, the next uh, 30, 26 years are, are, uh, are completely unpredictable. Uh, the technological advances of last few years showed, especially in, in, uh, in, uh, in ICT, in, in, uh, uh, nowadays in art artificial intel intelligence, it shows such a tremendous uh, possibilities coming up that we even don't know what will happen in general. Many, thing, many things will change, many things will change that we now consider to be, uh, um, to be a norm. And in my instance, that I'm the person who wants to move faster in general, I am very fond of waiting for it. I, in general, uh, hope that I will be alive at 2050, personally. Although I'm a male uh, and with not very good habits, so <laughs> let's see what happens. Uh, but in, in general, uh, the, uh, I think this will be a tremendous uh, time to live in. For Latvia, for Baltic states, uh, at least for the next decade, it will also be a very hard time uh, because the, the, uh, the uh, regional um, security situation is very bad for us. Uh, the investors will, will unfortunately shy away from us. Even local investors will will be uh, looking for uh, diversification. It's it's a hard hard years and then very responsible years for for public sector to show the best that we can in public sector, that we can be the best ones. Uh, that for uh, every single uh, entrepreneur uh, with a, with open heart say yeah, you should stay here and work here. You will get the results and you will you are expected here. That's a very uh, big. Uh, um, challenge, but at the same time an opportunity, as I always said, during the uh, worst times we t t tend to uh, mobilize much more and, and get better results. Yeah, and just my prediction, what perhaps will be, but not uh, on 2050, but already after some years will be some internet free space or areas in regions yeah because should be some like uh, answer to this what is happening now technologies of course uh, some uh, kind of people like me yeah are feel uh, worse and worse yeah because of this yeah and maybe this will be because now we speak about ecological products in agriculture and so but then pollution yeah but it will be some maybe some technologies and internet free spaces yeah somewhere yeah some regions will say that our region is first internet free, yeah, like, like <laughs> our region, yeah. Who knows, who knows, yeah. But uh, uh, thank you very much for this discussion, all of Martelsman, uh, Zenonas Norkas, Haris Rokpelni, Sagita Livinja, and Yuri Spoutse. Thank you very much. Now we have a coffee break, and uh, then we will continue our discussion. Thank you very much, yeah.
Okay, dear colleagues, uh, let's continue our uh, conference. And uh, now we will continue with panel uh, uh, main findings of Baltic 100 project, and we will uh, discuss things related to uh, GDP, national, regional. And uh, now I will uh, give a floor yeah, to this uh, chairperson of this panel, Ola Gruten. Yes, please. No, you should manage this. Us say what to what to do. I know there are two presentations, yeah, but uh, and, and and then uh, discussion part, yeah, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. How you plan this, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. My name is Ulla Gritten, uh, professor professor of economics his, economic history at the Norwegian School of Economics, in Bergen, Norway. Uh, I um, have been very happy to be part of this team. Uh, I am um, quite impressed by the results, um, and I have to see, say that it, uh, the leadership has been extremely good. Very many projects, research projects, people just write about whatever they want to write about. And you don't understand it's really a part of a project because they write about different things. But here it's very... It's, it's very persistent, so uh, I'm impressed, and I'm also very impressed by the calculations done by the, the Lithuanian team uh, when it comes to GDP and GDP disparities. And I'm extremely impressed by the productivity of um, Senunas Norkis. Uh, the one of them, no, not, not one of them, the most productive researchers I have ever met. <laughs> and I said to some of you, if he had been an American, he would have been a, one of the biggest names in economic history in the world. I'm so sure. So, but okay, he's uh, a local hero, and that's good. Uh, but first now, uh, we will let Adomas, who is a PhD scholar at uh, Oxford and speaks very good Oxford English. Uh, he's about to present his impressive data on GDP. Okay, good. Um, can people raise hands who haven't uh, attended yesterday's session? Okay, we have quite a few ones. So for those who have, it might be some repetition, but I also received word from uh, the next presentation speakers that I can spend a little more time. So when you give more time to a person interested in history to speak, usually that person takes up a lot more than expected, so be careful with these, yeah, with these suggestions in the future. Um, yeah, uh, before I start, I would also like to uh, congratulate the team on very, very productive work. And uh, the people who helped us with the data are also imperative to the success. And these include even those who are not here at present, for example, those who could not come to the conference, like Vitotas, who is still in Vilnius. So I'm very thankful for the entire team. And uh, for me, it was a great pleasure to, to work together, hopefully not the last. Um, right, so yesterday, the talk got a little emotional. We, we saw some results that uh, raised people's interest and raised people's emotions. So um, I was thinking whether to try to make this um, answer these emotions, but I think it might end up sparking even more. So, um, I guess future research is, is, is the only answer to, uh, you know, calming down those emotions. So now I will present a little bit more of the technical aspects of how historical GDP is calculated, how we did it for the interwar period, how we did it for the uh, Soviet period, so that it's more or less clear to people that we're not inventing these numbers or trying to push through some you know, political agenda, but rather trying to find the truth. So what we knew about the Baltic states up until uh, the beginning of this project, 
probably all of you have heard of the term the Baltic Tigers, such a impressive growth pattern that we had up until the 2008 crisis. And uh, uh, okay, it's not the the pointer is not showing the screen. Anyway, you can see it's going on the wall, so you yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter. Um, we can see that the growth rate in the first uh, decades of the 2000s, after 1995... Adomas, sorry, but you should somehow manage to speak in microphone. Oh, the or microphone. Or you can take another one, just, yeah. You, if you go there, then, then it's okay. He will use this, yeah. yeah. They accept it, yeah. Probably. You know what, I'll, I'll probably stay here. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Uh, in any case, you can see that in the first 15 years, up until 2008, the growth rate was probably even unsustainably high. Those Baltic Tigers, the growth of the Baltic Tigers was not very sustainable, but it's still impressive. And uh, I could distinguish a tiger whenever I see growth rates two times higher than, let's say, European Union's average. And that's what happened since 2010 as well. European Union, compared to the Baltic states, is almost stagnating in the recent, in the, in the, in the last decade as well. So the Baltic states are, have been a success story for the last uh, 20, 25 years. And we, all we know from history is that um, it used to be an agrarian, agricultural periphery 100 years ago. So the long-run question that our data can help answering is how does an agricultural periphery devastated by conflicts, by depopulation, deportation, switching from markets to forced uh, uh, command systems, still managed to achieve positive growth and uh, continue converging towards, towards the Western levels. Another question is, if the Baltic states are such a unique example of growth today, small countries able to achieve growth in a turbulent world of, of the, you know, 2020s. Is it something that we did in the last years that is so specific? Or maybe it's inside us or inside our history of the whole 100 years that we're able to reproduce better growth than our neighbors. And also, as yesterday I, I pointed out, this data allows us to more firmly answer the question whether the Baltics are part of Eastern Europe, Northern Europe. So we will touch upon that a little bit. And one funny thing is that I recently watched a video from 1989 amidst the protests in Vilnius. Um, there were some people gathered and there was an old uh, Russian-speaking lady, older, not old, um, and uh, she couldn't understand why the Baltic people are protesting? Why are they demanding independence? And at one point she says, my friends who come from Russia, they say that you guys live like in America. <laughs> this is the West of the USSR. Why would you ever want to get away from this if you are in such a comparatively good position? So now this data will firmly answer you how far we were from America and how far that lady was from tr the truth. So uh, again, a little bit about my work. So I've been constructing the GDP data sets for the Baltic states since 2018, beginning from Lithuania, now encompassing all of the uh, Baltic states. And I'm finishing my uh, PhD at the University of Oxford this year hopefully successfully. And besides that, my second job is cartography. I create maps. I draw historical and modern maps in vintage style. So if anybody's interested in that, we can talk about it later. I never skip a chance to promote myself a little. Um, and it, here's a map that uh, kind of leads towards our discussion. This is the blank of in the world GDP. GDP is the most important economic indicator and each country which wants to exist today needs to have that data. Now if we look at the interwar period, so 100 years ago, there are so many blanks in the world that are still not filled. So we don't know anything about the interwar growth in Africa, in many of the Asian countries, and sadly we did not know a lot about the Baltics as well. If you look at Europe, in the interwar period, 
And arguably, in this period, modern economic thought, the Keynesian economic thought was formed, we didn't have any data to base our own experiences on because we didn't just have it at all. And the only countries, actually, Iceland should be colored. There is that data, but I couldn't find it in the Madison project. So Baltics were the only gaps remaining in Europe. Now, if we look at the Soviet period, we get even a worse situation. Almost in the entire world, only the post-Soviet countries and some of the lesser, lesser developed regions um, scattered across the globe didn't have any growth, aggregate growth data. So it is apparent that we were lagging behind and we were basing our economic policies only based on the last few decades of data because we didn't have anything longer term, while other countries could develop their own post-Keynesian policies, simply look at that, their experience during the interwar period. So our job has been to close this gap, of course. Uh, you might ask, why GDP? There are issues with the GDP estimations. People say it doesn't show uh, economic inequality. Uh, again, repeating myself from yesterday, GDP is a decent indicator of living standards and happiness for average countries, average normal countries. If we look at Africa, if we look at uh, Middle East, which are oil-rich countries, you might see that happiness is low there because most of the people are living in misery, but GDP per capita is very high because the oil magnates are driving it up average-wise. If you look at Africa, the situation is reverse. So many countries are super poor, but Nigeria, for some reason, is very happy. You can ask them why, but if you look at the average countries like Lithuania, Latvia, France, Germany, Netherlands, an increase in income per capita usually leads to an increase in reported happiness. Those people, when asked, fairly respond more often that they're happy. So it's a, it's a decent indicator of living standards and it's the only economic monetary indicator of living standards because HDI, for example, or happiness index are indexes. You cannot measure it in dollars, uh, euros or anything else. So I argue that GDP is not the best, but it's the only, the only one we can, we can reasonably use, especially for extended periods of time. So what we, our project actually began even before it officially began. So Estonians were the first to produce uh, interwar uh, GDP series in 2005. Uh, we tried to improve them a little bit. Martin has done it uh, a few years ago. Um, I extended it uh, this year to, to, to cover the entire interwar period. And then there was a huge gap until 2018 when this whole process really kicked off. So in 2018, 2019, there were first estimations of Lithuanian GDP, of indirect estimates by Zanonas and Jurgita for all of the Baltic states. Uh, in 2022, already part of this project, uh, we estimated the uh, Latvian uh, first robust interwar GDP figure, and then extended next year both Lithuanian and Latvian figures to the whole interwar period. So interwar period was by 2023 fully covered and as it happens with most of the projects the last year is the most productive so in 2024 early 2024 late 2023 uh, we were able to adjust the existing 1990 figures and get the uninterrupted series for the entire Cold War period up until 1995 and then connect these figures to the existing uh, World Bank, Eurostat and Madison project figures of post-1995. Uh, um, connecting, anchoring that is another issue. I will not spend too much time on, on, on this. If anybody's interested in the specifics of how you connect you know, new figures with existing ones, we can discuss it later on or, or in the discussion. So a basic method, some basic methodolo methodological principles that we should touch upon, um, and I will be expecting some questions from, uh, from uh, Ola's team from Norway about uh, the way we extrapolate them, but in any case, um, for most countries that either don't have enough data for income or, or expenditure, we use the production side 
approach to estimate historical GDP statistics. And uh, while in modern days you would have every year a collection of data on each economic sector, agriculture, industry, uh, services, construction, and stuff like that, you gather uh, income on value added, on output and consumption. The difference is the value added this sector creates. You add it up and you get the GDP. So that happens in, in modern days. For historical periods, we don't have enough data to do that. So what we do, first of all, is we uh, choose a base year. A year where we have good data on all of the economy, at least the best data we can get. So for interwar period, in Latvia's case, for example, that was 1935. So then we estimate the value added of each economic sector for that base year, which in this case is 1935. And then we use uh, correlated data, like um, amount of milk uh, from a cow, let's say. If, if we don't have monetary data on how much the milk sector increased from 1935 to 1936, but we know that the amount of milk produced increased from 10 million liters to 20 million liters, then we can more or less safely assume that the size of milk sector increased two times. So of course this has uh, deflation issues when you have increasing productivity. Let's say if, um, if uh, less and less feeding material is needed for each cow to produce one liter of milk, we should adjust for that. But at least for the interwar period, we can more or less safely assume that there were no big increases in the productivity or, or, or relative prices of, of, of uh, feedings uh, versus, versus uh, milk. So, so we assume that these correlated data provide us with, with the series of growth. So each economic sector, beginning from milk production, ending with metals or, or, or banking or whatever you, whichever sector we look at, we try to find some correlated series and then we extrapolate uh, each sector and then combine it to get the GDPs of, 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 the, uh, of the whole economy in, in the whole period. So for uh, interwar period, in Lithuania's case, the base year was 1937. In Latvia's case, it was 1935. In, uh, the, for the Soviet period, the same thing was done using 1990. So 1990 was the, the base year. Um, the issue with the Soviet period is that we can in no way use the monetary data uh, in constant or whatever rubles. Why? Because prices in the Soviet Union were determined by the state and therefore monetary um, indicators are not very useful. In uh, the Soviet period we always had to dig into these physical indicators and according to the CIA, which um, calculated uh, GDPs for uh, the entire Soviet Union, this is the way to go. And more or less the only way to go if you want to cover the whole period. You can have several scattered years uh, being covered by these, uh, you know, in-depth calculations, but if you want to cover the entire period, you will eventually have to resort to using physical indicators such as milk tons, such as tons of metal produced, and stuff like that. Right, so once we aggregated all the data and got all of the results, we started analyzing them, and I will show you some of the graphs, some of the slides, which you know, show the significance of the Baltics and, and their in interesting uh, growth patterns. Here, the Baltics are the green line, they are aggregated together. Nordics are the blue line aggregated together and uh, the European Union, including the UK, in its current borders plus the UK, is the red line. So, from very far perspective, it almost looks like we have a similar growth trends. It's, it's not that different. It's not that we're going all the way down and they're going all the way up. The difference is that our growth has been consistently hindered by international shocks and especially um, war devastation. So if we look at the very beginning, which is 1913, one year before the First World War, the Baltics seem to be fairly well off, not too far from, from, the, uh, from the rest of Europe, but then 
it seems like the First World War hit us way more than the rest of Europe. Then we have quite decent growth, and especially if we compare to the EU, it seems like um, in the 1930s, we are growing even faster than they are. But then another war, and bam, we're down again, way more than they are. Then during the Soviet period, up until 1970s, it seems like the productivity of Lithuanians, Latvians, and Estonians kept on increasing, and it seemed to be looking well, at least in the average productivity of the, of the Baltic uh, employees, not maybe their living standards. And then, bam, 1970s, 1980s, there's complete stagnation in the whole socialist uh, bloc, and that includes the Baltic states. Europe and the Nordics are still firmly growing, maybe not as fast as before, and the gap is starting to increase. And then what happens in the 90s? Bam! Another shock. There's no shock in the Nordics, there's no shock in, in, in EU and uh, um, EU average, because they were not part of the Soviet Union. And we have the huge shock, and even in 2008 crisis, our shock was um, more pronounced than, than in, the, in the rest of Europe. So it seems like we have the potential to grow, and that potential is more or less similar to the Western potential of growth. It's just that it only happens where, when we are allowed to grow, to grow without any international shocks. Just leave the Baltics alone and probably we will be best. Now, um, I distinguish four periods of exceptional Baltic uh, strive to reach the European Union's levels. And uh, that would be first before the uh, First World War, then during the Great Depression. It seems like the Baltics, and I will look at it in a little bit more detail afterwards, because it's probably the period we should be the most proud of. Um, these were the periods when we were approaching European level, levels much faster than the rest of East Central Europe. East Central Europe, which is Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and now Czechia and Slovakia, these countries seem to share the history with us, right? They had the same war devastation, they were occupied by the same empires, they were coerced into the Soviet uh, sphere of influence at least. But it seems like they're not sharing the same economic uh, trends as we, uh, as we had. Even in the Soviet period, our growth seemed to have been more positive than theirs. And only in the last few decades, um, you know, our, our growth patterns were, were kind of the same and we're approaching the EU levels as fast as, as the rest of the Eastern European region. But in my opinion, this distinguishes the politics in the sense that we were hit by international crisis as much as the rest of Eastern European area. But when we had a time and uh, we were allowed to freely grow and converge, we did it better than Poles, Hungarians, Czechoslovaks, and others. Now, the interwar is the period I think we should fix in our minds as one of the success stories, especially for Latvia and Estonia. Um, if we look at the graph on the left, we can see I included the 1913 figures from uh, Zanonas and Jurgita's study. Again, the slowdown, the, the decline that we had uh, during the First World War is incredibly large. So the, f the entire first decade of the interwar period was only meant for recovery from the First World War. The Baltic states, especially Latvia, which had the front line, extending right through the middle of the country during the First World War was the most devastated by the war country in the whole Europe. It was the last to recover to its uh, 1913 levels of all the European states. So all the more incredibly, these Baltic economies, all of them, if we look at the graph on the right, since the onset of the uh, Great Depression in 20, uh, 1929 were able to achieve one of the fastest growth levels in the entire continent. So by 1929, all of them were recovered. All of Europe was already back on its organic growth rates. And that last period, those last 10 years of independence, proved to be the time when we were catching up with Europe the fast. 
the fastest. Europe is the um, dotted line there on the right, uh, which seems to be growing the slowest. And our growth rates were no, no different from Finland's. Uh, uh, and, 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 and that's true for all of the Baltic countries. Uh, so that is in, in, in the first view, and I've already analyzed the interwar period in more depth. I believe it's um, mainly due to superior policies that the Baltic economists and Baltic, especially Latvian and Estonian policymakers took in the wake of the Great Depression crisis. So Great Depression worked as, um, well, one of the biggest impacts of the Great Depression was the complete contraction of world trade. And that was, and the whole crisis was distributed through the whole world through the flawly working gold standard. So the theory, and now most of the most of the scientists agree that if you see your trade levels contracting, your exports becoming less competitive in on the onset of the Great Depression crisis. The faster you abandon the gold standard and either let your currency float or uh, uh, peg it to another currency which is floating, which in, in this case was the British pound, your income levels start to rise again faster and that correlates with the recovery of trade. So since we have the data, it's the first time we can analyze the so-called trade to GDP ratios or the openness to trade uh, in the Baltic states. And we can see that, first of all, the uh, green line, Lithuania, always had a very low trade level. And that's probably one of the reasons why it was not impacted by the crisis and was able to grow, is because it was a relatively closed economy. But Latvia and Estonia had trade levels similar to UK and Finland. So those were, in the 1920s, really successfully trading economies. But what happened when the crisis started, we can see all of both of these two lines are plunging down, almost reaching the Lithuanian level. And then what happens in 1931? Both Latvia and Estonia, they stop converting their currencies to gold and therefore, in essence, abandoning the gold standard. And we can already see that their trade levels stop decreasing in that that quick, uh, in, in uh, that fast. And then Estonia devalued their currency in 1933, completely abandoning the gold standard and deciding to stick to the sterling block together with the, with the UK. And in 1933, their trade levels are going up already that fast. Latvia postponed its decision up until 1936. And again, in 1936, the red line is going up. So this kind of allows us to see that a small country which seems to be embroiled in the whole world plunging towards the Second World War, closing down its trade, even such small countries could make difference, a small difference if their policies are quick and if they're sound. And I think what Olaf mentioned about the 90s, about the Estonian policies in the 90s, also uh, confirms that. If you're not afraid to take bold policy actions, you might win. And uh, in this case, and in the 90s case, Estonia was the clear winner. Latvia in, 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 in 1930s was one of the winners as well. Lithuania, in my opinion, lost out. It could have uh, devalued or at least uh, started controlling its currency and would have seen even faster growth. Now, interwar modernization is another issue that I touched upon yesterday. Um, so, inter, uh, Latvians are proud of their uh, DEF factory, right? It's, it's the radio factory that sprang up uh, uh, for, because of the state investments in the 1930s. And uh, it's true that in all of the Baltic states, the fastest growing sector was industry. And those innovative branches of the industry were, of course, among the drivers of that growth. The, um, uh, yellow bars here show the industrial growth. So it's almost double the growth rate of the other sectors during the 1930s. So that is true. The issue is that throughout the entire interwar period, if we go back to um, this slide, 
the green sector, which is the agricultural sector in all of the Baltic countries, still continued to dominate. And industry, which is the black sector, only accounted for 20, maybe in Lithuanian case, even less than 20% of the GDP. So even if you have very fast growth in industry, it takes a lot of time for industry to, you know, double in size to at least be the size of, of the agriculture. And the most of the overall growth was still in the hands of the agricultural sector. And agriculture, sadly, was not a fast modernizing sector. If we look at the number of tractors per million hectares, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia were still far behind the industrialized economies. Even though in the UK, obviously, agriculture was not as important as industry, they still were better modernized in, even in that sector. Um, another example of, um, you know, limited success. In general, our success was great if we compared to our previous standings. But if we compare to global standings, if we look at, say, at the electrical energy generation, which is correlating with the amount of people living in cities, because cities usually have more electricity, amount of people living, number of people living in cities was still low in the Baltics, and therefore, um, it reflects in, in the electricity data. Electric, electric energy generation per capita in 1940 was way lower in the Baltic states than, than in, uh, in the industrialized countries. So we were on the good path. It was a success story for um, the region east of, let's say, France or east of Germany. But it was a limited success in a way that we needed more time. Now, if we look at the occupation period, I still haven't had, uh, uh, haven't spent enough time analyzing that. This is part of my thesis, and the thesis is not due until uh, September, October, so I still have some time. But some general first uh, impressions I will try to already share with you. Uh, so we can divide, I think, the occupation period into two parts. The first part is the pre-stagnation uh, period when the Baltics seem to be advancing fast. And now, to make it clear, yesterday we had an emotional discussion. Um, GDP per capita in the Soviet system is not entirely reflective of the living standards. Why? Probably most of you have heard that half of the stuff, a lot of the stuff that the Baltic companies produced during the Soviet period were shift shifted, transitioned to the Soviet Union, and uh, some people have called it involuntary foreign aid. So, you know, we have voluntary foreign aid that we give, let's say, to Ukraine right now. The foreign aid that we gave free of charge to the Soviet Union was obviously not a voluntary aid. So, GDP and GDP per capita in Soviet period for the Baltic states, it shows the productivity of the Baltic worker. So it shows that the Baltic states, the people in the Baltic states up from uh, 1966, all of the Baltic states were able to be more productive than the Soviet Union average. It's another story why this was all, half of it was shifted back to the Soviet Union. But the fact is, Baltic workers were among the most productive in the whole Eastern Eastern Bloc. Um, so whenever somebody asks whether life quality increased the same way, no, it didn't. But that's another story for another period of research. Now, if we look at the beginning of this growth, uh, up until 1948, 47, 49, we see that all of the Baltics seem to be growing fast, even, even in uh, the green line in Lithuania, because it's the post-war growth. Whenever you have a war devastation, usually coming back from that is, is fast enough. But once you reach a certain level, then the growth has to be organic. And in, as we saw in the 1930s, post-1929, okay, we have less time. But uh, Jurgita told me I could spend a little bit more because their presentation is going to be shorter. Um, so post-1929, the organic Baltic growth was fairly positive. Post-1949, it was terrible. Who can guess why? 
up until Stalin's death, so 1949-1953. Sector was uh, agriculture and agriculture Yep, it's the collectivization. Especially pronounced in Lithuania, we see that up until 1953 there's almost complete stagnation because uh, all of the uh, most productive farmers were shipped to Siberia and whatever is left was you know in the hands of the state and nobody wants to productively plow the land that is you know not your own uh, entirely. Now after Stalin's death we have the Khrushchev period, the period of warming, the thaw and uh, certain autonomy given back to the Baltic republics and the regional economic planning seemed to have produced decent results. The, the forced uh, industrialization at least in the sense of productivity worked up until 1970s and the Baltics were you know, growing even faster than Soviet Union average uh, reported in GDP per capita. Uh, both uh, Latvia and Estonia always were above the Soviet average. Lithuania only surpassed it in 1966. Okay, we can also uh, have later a discussion of what does that mean, but in general it means that life quality probably was improving, productivity was improving even faster, and the Baltics were becoming fast uh, the most productive region of the Soviet Union. What happened in the later part of the occupation is, as I said before, a complete stagnation. In the entire communist bloc you had this stagnation and it did not uh, you know, pass through the Baltics unnoticed. Absolutely, the Baltics were stagnating. The most interesting part here is that um, Previously reported figures seem to show that in 1989 there was a big jump in Estonian GDP per capita. There was a reasonable jump even in 1990 in Latvian data. And when we recalculated all of that and we have the new results, the red line, the solid red line, which is Latvia's economy growth, we can see there's no growth from 1986 already. So 1986, even though moderately, was the last positive year. And from then on, Latvian economy was plunging down. And that plunge was accelerated, of course, in the, in the transition crisis. Again, as mentioned before by Olaf, we can see that post-1990, Estonian you know, decline is way, seems to be way more modest than in Latvia and Lithuania. And actually, that is the period which brought Estonia forward. Up until then, Latvia and Estonia seemed to be on the same level. Uh, Lithuania was uh, a little bit poorer. What happened in the 90s? Lithuania and Latvia equalized. We were at the same poor, and Estonia managed to avoid the, the, the huge contraction that we had. And since then, Estonia is where we're on the top. And I will look at that data later. But then, before, before that, I will show the the reason why I think it's okay to show uh, politically that there was growth in the Soviet Union. Of course there was growth in the Soviet Union. If we look at the last data point in 1939 and the first data point in 1995, still there was an increase in living standards, even if we look at the non-Soviet data. But if we, if we would take the officially reported Soviet measures, which is the red line, we can see that compared to the newly estimated figures, the growth would have been even almost exponential. So that is the power of Soviet propaganda and whenever somebody says that Lithuanian industry was growing that fast or Baltic industry was growing that fast, it obviously wasn't. The growth rate should be divided by two. And the last part, of course, is post-1990. Um, we could call it an ongoing su success story. Uh, the Baltic states have had the fastest growth, growth levels in the whole of, uh, the whole of Europe. And um, we can see even in the last, uh, in the last years um, the, the divergence flipped. If we had Estonia in the lead up until the uh, 2008 crisis, Lithuania and Latvia were on the same level. Something happened during the 2008 crisis that left Latvia on the lowest path and Lithuania managed to, to achieve, achieve better standards and even overcome um, Estonia. 
And comparatively, if we look at the interwar period, the level of European Union convergence that Latvia was able to achieve in 1938 was 90% of European Union's level. Today, even Lithuania and Estonia haven't reached that level, which means that Latvia in interwar period was more westernized than Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and whichever of them you take, is today. So for us, probably, Lithuanians and Estonians, current period is the golden age. Latvia should be proud the most of the interwar period and try to do something in, in, in these days. So to conclude, um, definitely uh, Baltic, exceptional Baltic growth levels is not only a modern phenomenon. It, it has been repeated before. And in whatever system we are, we seem to be able to produce better results than our neighbors. Whether that is uh, interwar independence and trade closing down in the whole world, whether that is a Soviet occupation period, and whether that is modern independence, we seem to be able to produce better growth results than our neighbors, and especially when we are left alone uh, to, to, to have our independence and to, to grow in the capitalist system. How does that happen? Many things are not controlled by the Baltics. Let's say free trade in the whole world or capitalist framework which was taken from us in 1940. But what we can control as independent states is policy making. And it's clear that small states have been able to produce better growth through sound policies. And that's clear on the interwar example of Latvia and Estonia and clear on the modern example, probably of Estonia in the 1990s. So I'd argue that the Baltic economies should not be um, attached to Eastern Europe because they were constantly throughout the four different periods of growth were able to overcome the Eastern European levels of growth. And uh, by many, many times uh, in the 1930s, they were negatively growing. We were among the best growing countries in, in the whole Europe. But even in the rest of the periods, the red, the red bar is always a little bit lower than the, than, than the green one. So it shows that the Baltics are exceptional in that sense. But also, we're definitely not there to, to compare ourselves to the Nordic neighbors, uh, maybe in the future. But as of today, it seems like the Baltics are an, a unique small region of robust capitalist economies that should be treated and analyzed uniquely, um, both for the sake of our future growth, to develop our future growth policies based on our own experience, but also as examples for other countries with, which might transition uh, to capitalism in the future. So I hope what, that was interesting, and we will probably have a discussion later. Thank you, Adomas. And before we have some comments, we will uh, let um, Senonas and Yogita give their presentation. And then we have two commentators before our discussion. Uh, well, actually, this presentation will be made by Yogita. And I will just uh, want to use this occasion, because this is uh, our meeting, well, just to express the gratitude for Latvian well, leaders of our whole project, and, but in particular for the well, uh, Lithuanian part of the team. You know, I was happy to attract to this well, project real superstars. And you know, well, uh, it is, well, easy when, when you <coughs> preside over superstars, it is difficult. Well, uh, no, Adomas needs no price. It, it is discovery of, well, you know, this decade, well. But, uh, well, I won't say also that uh, 
uh, we could not do so much without contribution of well uh, other Lithuanian participants. Uh, I was not able to well uh, persuade Vitautas to come here. He was too busy. He said, "I don't want to was the time." Well, and he was very critical on uh, many aspects of our work, but uh, he did all his work well, very good. Thank you, Vitautas. Uh, well, and uh, you know, I thank uh, well all of those well uh, words of praise and madness. But I should confess, I would not be able to be so productive and achieve without well Yurgita. Actually, uh, everything w what we did well, it was like playing piano uh, for hands, for hands. Well, so thank you, Urgita, for those years well of intellectual partnership and uh, well no I, I should make some personal confession my mother was uh, he teached mathematics well uh, so and uh, well Urgita you know is mathematician and always I have a bit well attitude well like to mother <laughs> despite well difference in age well thank you thank you <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much and for this introduction. Of course, uh, yes, this is the difference. I'm a mathematician, so I look uh, in the world through numbers. And this is always interesting to work with this. So uh, today uh, we will talk about the regional differences of the Baltic states uh, uh, through 100 years. Why I said to Thomas that he could uh, speak longer because lots of uh, interesting uh, things what we uh, found Zenonas already presented during the panel discussion. So just I will be a bit more on statistics and methodology. So, uh, as Anna has mentioned, uh, we used the methodology which was already um, developed, but this methodology, even if it is developed, it's not so easy to apply to other cases. So, Baltic uh, countries was quite, quite an issue to apply this, but uh, we started from the book, The Economic Development of the Europe Regions, and uh, we even wanted to do this earlier in another project, uh, but um, uh, this was... Uh, uh, the problem of the data collection, so finally we could uh, do this in here. So, indeed, regional GDP estimators, uh, the methodology which was used by Roses and Wolf was invented by Geary and Starks. They applied, uh, uh, they wrote a paper how to estimate regional uh, GDPs uh, having very little data, only people working in the sectors in the regions in different, and having wages in these sectors. So, quite uh, good methodology. I will soon present it. And Roses and Wolf applied this methodology indeed for the, um, yes, it does not show, no, it disappears, sorry, so uh, they apply this methodology on us to regions for the older European countries, so with the, for the Baltic states, we did not have GDP at first for the long period, and of course the second part, uh, we did not have regional GDP estimates, uh, so we, what we did, we estimated and we used NUTS 3 region, not NUTS 2 regions. Uh, so, Giri Stack's methodology is, uh, has quite simple idea, but a uh, very reasonable idea. So, of course, the national GDP is the sum of regional GDPs. Yes, so, and uh, how to estimate regional GDP? If you have the output per worker in the industry in the region, and you have labor force, so you can estimate the regional GDP. The problem is, you don't have the output per worker. So, how to do this? So the, the, uh, they argue the, that the output per worker in the region and the sector is proportional to the national output per worker in the sector and the um, wages in the sector and region. So they use uh, the ratio of the national wages uh, in the sector with the wages in the sector and region, uh, in that in particular sector and region. So this is, was the approximation of the um, methodology. And there, of course, from a mathematical point of view, they needed some coefficient beta. Uh, this is just uh, 
finally to add up all the regional GDPs to the national GDP. Some small correction where you lose some in some estimates. So very simple methodology from the for me as from the mathematician. Now let's go to the uh, issues. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, more formulas, I love formulas. <laughs> um, next, when we estimate the regional GDP, we wanted also to estimate the inequalities. And uh, how, how to estimate the inequality? Of course, there are many measures. Um, I don't know which measure is the best, and I don't think that anyone knows. So we used uh, four maybe most popular me measures in, in this field. Uh, we used weighted measures. Weighted, it means that we, um, we take into account the population in the regions. And the first measure which we used is coefficient of variation. Coefficient of variation is a very simple measure, but uh, if you just look at the standard deviation of variance, so it depends, of course, on the, uh, if the mean is different, standard deviation also, this, uh, the size is different. So coefficient of variation just take into account the mean, and then you, you have a measure which does not have uh, um, me measuring units and easy to compare with others. Next, Gini index. Everyone knows that Gini index is good to estimate the income inequality, so it can be uh, uh, changed and a little bit and used to estimate the regional inequalities. And there are two more um, measures of inequality which we use, so mean logarithmic deviation and tail index. These two indexes uh, are the cases of the entropy index. Entropy index also was invented to measure income inequality and economic inequality. Uh, the positive side of this uh, measure is that you get the composant of the um, uh, within and between groups in equality. We did not make the decomposition, but uh, you can use also these methods. So we used four measures to, just to see at the inequalities between regions. So now let's go to the data. Uh, interval period, uh, in order to have the data for the uh, workers in the region and in the industry, uh, separate sectors, of course, we needed uh, such a huge amount of data, and this we had from the census uh, information. Uh, Latvia is the most rich, rich in the interval period in the census uh, case because uh, they had census in 25, 30, and 35 years. So we could uh, do this research in, uh, for the three years. In Lithuania, we had only one census in 1923. Uh, according to the law, there should be two censuses, uh, uh, at least two censuses because each 10 years it should be. But uh, in 1933, when there was still crisis after crisis year, so it was postponed and finally did not uh, appear. In Estonia, uh, the census was in 1922, but we had GDP estimate only for 1923, so we used GDP for 1923 and census data from 1922, and the second census was in 1934. Of course, without the Thomas numbers or, and Valgas numbers on the GDP national breakdown, we could not have any productivity, so this was our initial data. And uh, wages data we use from the national statistics, which uh, was quite, especially in agriculture, was quite uh, good, easy to find uh, some services estimates we made as a, uh, suggested Gear and Stark, just services, uh, the third, uh, uh, which includes everything and services and public sector, a very huge sector. Uh, uh, we used the wages as the average of the um, industry, manufacturing and construction, and ag agricultural wages. Just um, so, but everything uh, uh, except the services uh, wages we got from the uh, national statistics. So interwar period, uh, it was uh, quite a lot of work to find data and to, especially to recalculate maybe uh, some uh, aggregate to do some aggregations, but we could do this. Uh, for the uh, Soviet period, um, there is a big problem in the wages. Uh, we can find wages on the national level, but not on the regional level. So that's why we still um, 
did not man uh, manage to apply this methodology, so we are looking for other type of methodologies, what we could apply. And data after the Soviet period, uh, so we have very nice data from 2000 in Eurostat for all countries and uh, from 1995 or 96 up to 2000. We get from the national statistics, so, for example, Latvian data is possible to find through some archives, uh, but not directly through Latvian statistics, but just uh, looking around, but they give finally it from Latvian statistics. So uh, we uh, had quite a lot of data, so further we will compare. Now results for Latvia. Methodology, uh, I hope, is clear. The problem, how to compare Latvia interwar period and Latvia now. Uh, the regions change. In the interwar period, we did not, uh, there was no Periga region. Now there is a Periga region. So the changes of the region, people who uh, now are, uh, the counties which are now in Periga region were uh, taken separately, and the Periga region was also artificially composed and for interwar period. So uh, here we can see reach, ratio of regional GDP per capita to national GDP per capita. This is in percents for all three uh, years. Yeah, 1935. I put 1935 first because it was also the benchmark of, of the GDP years. And then, yes, 1930 and 1925. Of course, capital region, Riga, is, uh, performs best in this case. And um, uh, Latgale is the most poor region compared to the national GDP level. If we look situation for the modern, uh, the, uh, since on the map I cannot put all the data, so just few selected years after 2000. So in 2016, uh, we see that, of course, Riga is still the best performing, but uh, not so uh, high, uh, not so high performing as during the interwar period. So other regions are also step up a, a little bit, but Latgale region even went a little bit down compared to, to the other regions. So indeed, um, in situation inequality would uh, seems quite quite big, but just when we include the Riga. Now results for Lithuania. Other issues which we had. Uh, in Latvia, we had inner border changes. In Lithuania, we have outer border changes. In Lithuania, during the interwar, we did not have the whole Vilnius region. And so in order to compare Lithuania, uh, modern Lithuania, with the interwar Lithuania, we had to do some um, recalculations. There is one small region, which is called Tukmerge, which is my hometown <laughs> in that region. We needed to, to remove it at all from the computations. So if we remove uh, Ukmerge region, now belongs to the Vilnius region, and it's uh, from the Nuts 2 point manipulation, it's in the capital region. And if we remove Ukmerge, so uh, interwar borders without Ukmerge, and today's Nuts 2 uh, region, uh, the western Lithuania, coincides. So that's why we needed to remove. Of course, there was uh, one problem we just couldn't just uh, take and remove because Adam is calculated for the all national level and Ukmerge is included. So what we do, at first we calculated with Ukmerge and then we needed to, to uh, subtract everything what was related with Ukmerge and uh, regional GDP and workers and salaries and then compute just for that person. So uh, after this manipulation, here I give two maps. Since in Lithuania there was only one census, so everything is uh, in the map. As then as mentioned in the morning, Klaipeda, of course, since it is uh, German culture city, it was at, uh, joined with the Lithuania in 1923. Uh, so. Uh, Klaipeda region is the best performing during the interwar period, even in 1923. Looking at the preliminary estimates through all period, it stays the best performing, and it's still very good performing because it's port city. Now, 
the, we expected that, of course, capital region Kaunas would be the second. It was not the truth, because in 1923, it uh, just the capital just was creating in here, uh, from the, uh, and that's why it stayed third one. But now Kaunas even performing worse than uh, the uh, national level, and uh, the uh, Shaolin. What was surprise for us, surely, was best performing region. But of course, here we include and Vilnius region, and that's why generally inequality is quite big. If we exclude Vilnius region, we are getting a bit different numbers, since Vilnius, for, in the modern Lithuania, it's a capital region. So excluding it from the old Lithuania, we see that uh, Konas is performing quite better than uh, comparing, including Vilnius. Uh, so, uh, but still, uh, Klaipeda is uh, the first, Shaolin is the second, and uh, 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 in the modern Lithuania, Klaipeda the first, Shaolin second, uh, Kona second, and Shaolin third. In the interwar period, a little bit different. So this is for Lithuania, and with Estonia, as we were mentioned, uh, we still uh, this is very fresh results, and very uh, but still these results we can see that um, for the interwar period, uh, of course the uh, I'm sorry if I pronounce badly, Poya ST region, <laughs> I'm not, not sure how to pronounce, uh, performs the best because of course it's with the uh, talent with the capital city, yes? And uh, other, uh, uh, the second region in 1922, uh, also Kesk region and L Luna region seemed per performing quite good, so quite quite big part of Estonia were performing very good. Uh, Poya region st stays the best performing and in modern times, in 2000, 2002 and 2014, while um, the Kirde region and the Lani region with, that were um, not so good performing during interwar, they stayed the same. So uh, not, not so, uh, maybe huge changes in Luna region, I think there was some changes in inner borders or, or, or with some other regions, that's why this difference is so big. One Ah, so, so that's why this is the difference. So now, shortly, indexes of inequality. For the Latvia, we can see, and indeed in many countries, this, uh, the story repeats. If we live good, so inequality is bigger. If we have crisis, inequality gets lower so because we are getting closer to each other. We can see a similar story in the Latvia. You can see that in 1935, they, according uh, through all indexes, in 1935, inequality was the highest. While in 1925, it was the lowest, just uh, uh, after the war, the story. And the story repeats in every case. And for example, in 2011, after the crisis of 2008, the inequality also was small. In Lithuania, uh, inequality indexes with uh, including Kukmerge and excluding Kukmerge region are very similar, but of course, including Kukmerge region is inequality is bigger because Kukmerge was the poorest region at that moment in Lithuania. And uh, if we look at the modern inequality uh, in 2004 and 2014, uh, these are 2004 entering to European Union, 2014 already after crisis, so inequality is quite big because we are we're living quite good. In Estonia, uh, I don't want to compare interwar and uh, uh, modern times, just because, uh, as we mentioned, as there's a bit changes in in in, in the uh, borders. But still, uh, we see that in uh, 1934, compared to 1929, inequality uh, grows. It means Estonians get living better. Yes, and uh, for the modern 2002-2014, the inequality is quite similar. So this is my short presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot um, for a very good presentation too. So now we have two commentators, Agita and Yuris. I will give um, per perhaps yeah, you can sit here, both of you, and uh, Gita can give uh, a first comment, and then uh, after it's Yuris, and thereafter 
we will uh, make it open to the floor for questions. Okay, uh, Agita first, please. Thank you both presenters uh, of the date and uh, about the work, uh, what was uh, done. And uh, I am uh, thinking uh, according to the um, reflections of the first panel discussion uh, this morning uh, where uh, uh, Olaf's uh, highlighted this efficiency of the institutions. In my mind, uh, it could be well uh, to done uh, such analysis and research uh, about the institutional efficiency uh, of all three uh, Baltic countries during the timeline of 100 years. And uh, then to make analysis and interpretation of the GDP. Of, of, of the GDP. Uh, this is uh, one uh, point which I think uh, can be uh, useful. And then we can think what we can learn uh, from this data uh, for the future. <laughs> this is one note. Uh, and the second, um, Adam has uh, highlighted uh, this point about the west of the east. And uh, it could be uh, also uh, uh, valuable uh, to get the uh, explanation uh, uh, more deep about uh, this statement that all Baltic countries are the uh, west of east, based uh, and argued uh, with some uh, numbers and figures, not only by emotions. Uh, yes, it can be interesting for me uh, to listen to uh, some deeper explanation. Okay, thank you, Yuris. Uh, first of all, very interesting. Thank you for uh, um, uh, the opportunity, actually, to listen and, and hear and, and on, on this uh, discussion. I, I should apologize in the beginning that uh, I will need to leave at uh, half past one uh, sharp because I'm, I have been scheduled to be at three o'clock in Riga and I'm, I drive fast, but not so fast. I, I will want to. Uh, be there alive. Yeah, so <laughs> this uh, this is an important aspect. But uh, <clears throat> on the um, on on the presentations, uh, uh, while I was listening, I was uh, 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 all the time thinking. Um, Adam has mentioned that uh, we we have a very sound policies in the 30s, uh, the Baltic countries. I was the last economic history book about Baltics I read was Ivar Stranga's uh, analysis on economic policy of uh, of Latvia during authoritarian period, uh, economic history, and this is uh, uh, he, where he gives a blasting critique on on the uh, on the on the government's politi policies, also involving the period of, of uh, uh, parliamentary period, pre-authoritarian period, saying that every uh, uh, decision was uh, brought to uh, negative consequences, even sell selling that there was a real two-year discussion, two-year discussion in the cabinet minister of Carlos Ulmanis, how to uh, uh, push people out of Riga in a rural areas, not to work in industry, but to work in agriculture. How to get them uh, to get away out of industry, out of construction, uh, out of every single, just to go to end. To, uh, there, was a, there was a large discussion, as uh, Harris in, in this morning mentioned, on how to limit buying tractors because it gets, we will get less people in the countryside because of the tractors. The people will buy tractors, we will need less people. And uh, uh, this is a real policy discussion in the, in the cabinet of ministers of authoritarian period, which was 100% uh, uh, power in the, in the hands of, 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 of a dictator in his cabinet. But in general, this, is a, uh, th this was a fact. And also, he gives a critique on the fact that uh, we postpone the devaluation till 1936, which was mainly because of political reasons. There was a feeling that, um, again, farmers, will uh, pay more for imports, and that will uh, have a negative, uh, they will bring to negative attitudes from them towards the, uh, the government if they cannot buy imports and will need to buy only local stuff, locally produced industrial stuff, which was considered at the time of lower quality. It's better to, uh, we are 
These days we are very proud of uh, the fact that we produce a lot of bicycles during uh, uh, pre, uh, uh, interwar period. At that moment, buying Latvian bicycle was considered to be, uh, no, you'll have less money, so you buy Latvian bicycle. You should buy one from Germany or, or Netherlands, that's much be better bicycle. So this pressure from a, a rural population with a major pe power base for authoritarian government, they, th in that sense that they postponed decision on devaluation, they uh, had a uh, really uh, change of, of, of import duties, uh, actually uh, uh, favoring farmers to ex uh, on, on the expense of industrial producers. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, he at that moment. So it's interesting to hear uh, uh, a comparison of the uh, of the uh, of the um, uh, findings. Yeah, why we are so good if we are at the same time so bad. I, I could add to this one example. Yeah. Uh, in my book on uh, shipping in Latvia. I analyzed this period when devaluation was three years later than in Estonia. And that was a crucial point when Estonian merchant fleet overtook Latvian merchant fleet by capacity. And main reason, I think, is this uh, delayed devaluation of Latvian currency. It's quite clearly visible. So they pay their expenses in, in Latvia then, the fleet? For a fixed rate, for and rate. okay, so okay, okay, okay. They, they they lost lost the the, uh, the exports were, were hit hard on on that time for industrial production as well. Although most of the industrial production in interwar period wasn't uh, meant for uh, exports, it was mostly meant for internal market. That was the whole idea. There were large uh, customs barriers uh, not allowing in imported goods, which was a major, the, uh, at that moment, the secret police during authoritarian time, they kept a, quite a lot of written what the people talk. And the people were very, didn't like the fact that the uh, good merchandise from other countries were not allowed. And the major crime during the 30s was, of course, uh, contraband of goods. Speculation of and speculation of currency, two major crimes. I can add, uh, if you are uh, discussing about the uh, import during the Soviet time, uh, then we have a new producer, the movie uh, Soviet Jeans. Very good. Uh, yes, uh, I suggest you to watch it. Do the uh, presentators have uh, any comments to the comments? Mm -hmm. Oh, I would like to ask for the... Uh, you need a mic. Well, maybe we should just... Yeah, you can come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Very good idea. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the, w w what you say is complementing the data, it doesn't contradict the data, and I'm happy with that. Uh, I will just uh, ask for the names of the references that the book you mentioned and your your book about shipping, absolutely, that'll be quoted in my in my uh, dissertation for sure. So, Paldias for that. Okay, Jurgita. Uh, since about the regional economics, there was no comment, so I think I... <laughs> Uh, well, actually, uh, well, we we are for the questions about regional inequality. Well, concerning uh, well, uh, well, of the soundness or unsoundness, well, Lithuanian policies. Well, actually, as last year, Latvisky, I did, did read this well, uh, Stanga's book. Well. Uh, well, uh, I think it's a bit too critical. And, uh, well, he, he, he is very good in, uh, well, uh, using these uh, sources. But you cannot find any tables, well, in, uh, in his book, well. No he hates economic... Tables. He hates tables. He hates tables. Yeah. Yes, and... Uh, 
Uh, yes, and because there is no tables, and we are doing quantitative research, well, it's difficult to find, well, common ground, well, uh, well for discussion. Well, uh, basically, there are uh, two possibilities. That uh, One possibility, you can argue that after all those policies, well, uh, they are not so bad. Well, uh, in this period, in this time, under those circumstances, I mean uh, statist policies. Well, just, uh, uh, well, uh, well, now the, the world is flooded by, well, cheap capital. You can attract investments and, well, uh, consume, well, what uh, more than in those times. In those times, you should uh, make investments from internal accumulation. And only using the state, well, those investments could be mobilized. So it, it was a situation because, well, uh, uh, general situation in the world. Yeah, and absolutely. Well, the, I will comment on the infant yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah as but well, well uh, to continue, so maybe those policies were, were not so bad. Well, and uh, other policies, more liberal policies, maybe should have not worked. But there is another line of argumentation that uh, just uh, Latvian economy were so robust, so strong, so resilient that uh, she that could perform good even under not so very reasonable reasonable policies. So just uh, when you go into details, well, well, you can find that, well, Latvia it started to recover uh, even before this Ulmanis coup in 1933. So the, there was something here, well, and uh, uh, well, anyway, uh, what we did, well, I think, what Adomas actually uh, we, uh, did uh, prove it uh, Beyond uh, a reasonable doubt is that there was no this almanus like stagnation. Well, it's uh, it's another one myth. I I, I see there is new series. Uh, those well, uh, Latvian historians are now publishing so small books. Well, uh, myths, legends, uh, Fulman's times. I did see in bookstore. Well, so and well, you know, it's another just legend. Uh, well, Ullman's like a uh, type stagnation. Well, how to explain this? Well, uh, thanks to good policies or despite bad policies, so it's open to discussion. But actually, Latvian economy displayed robust uh, growth uh, uh, well since 1933. So, and well, next uh, about details can see it almost better. Yeah, I will not expand way more, but I think the only flaw of Ullmann's policy might have been that he delayed the devaluation. Having dictatorial powers, you can push through that decision earlier, and he didn't do that. I think he came to power in 34, right? Yeah. So it, the, he delayed the decision by two years, so maybe that's, that's the only flaw. But with regards to potentially liberal trading policies, uh, tariffs and stuff, interwar period was not a good period for trade. And the only option for a small country, drawing from Denmark's example in the 1800s, or even America's example in the 1800s, closing your most important infant industries and developing, even if those bicycles were not as good in quality, developing your own and therefore allowing your industry to grow inside and only opening it up when it's strong enough was the proven strategy that worked before and it seemed to start working for Latvia in the interwar as well and only the war and occupation brought that down. Olaf. Uh, we have one problem when judging uh, Baltic, especially Estonian and Latvian economic development and economic policies in the 1930s, and this is the international environment which favored Baltic exports. So when <coughs> the European economy recovers from the slump, people need more timber, they need more bacon, and they need more butter. So, and, and, and this, is a, this is a problem. Is it because of authoritarian rule that 
something happens in the economy, is it despite of or is it because of the international environment? Well, the only comment I have, in the 1920s, as I s showed the graph, the trade levels were even higher in the Baltics. So I think we were able to outperform many countries in trade levels even before the crisis. So, you know, it, it might not be as, you know, circumstantial uh, externally, but maybe our own policies as well. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. Got it. Okay, yeah. Uh, very, very short comment about this uh, woman is because in Latvia it's really important. Yeah, now we're really rewriting history. Yeah, and will be. I already predict a lot of discussions about because yes, uh, it's yes uh, books about woman. Is, Previous books were emotional. We can uh, speak about this Isilnik's big book because Isilnik hit Ulmanis and, and uh, he yeah and uh, wrote a lot of critics and uh, Ivar Strang is the same yeah and uh, he used more emotions uh, less that yeah and, and and so and this is problem but maybe where was this problem with Ulmanis why why he he really did this decision about devaluation so so late because it was problem after this uh, 1935 with decision making. He always postponed this. Yeah, it was very passive with this, and I think this helped somehow to develop economy. Yeah, of course they did some decisions about this nationalisation, something like that. But just yes, not taking decisions. Yeah, to postpone, postpone. Wait, what will happen? Something, some others will help. Somehow we can explain what happened in 1939, 1940. Yeah, but maybe un, uh, unprepared for the yeah, resistance to Soviet Union. He went to something. Yeah, and it's it's totally different person. Uh, uh, he was one person when we created our independent country, and so and and it's really it, it was very not active government, yeah, and, and, and despite of this, maybe economics and everything developed, yeah, and despite of this, because yet they, 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 they speak a lot about that we should uh, we have more, uh, more, uh, more workers and employment in, in countryside, but despite of this, it was uh, significant growth in industry, yeah, and in employment, yeah, and, and this is, yeah, but what we, should, we can learn then that, and it's like philosophical, philosophical question for historians that we should accept that something good is happening, yeah? I really hate Soviet occupation period because what happened with my family and so, but I accept data, yeah? And then we should just explain this and everyone know that it was huge production here, just we cannot ignore that how it was yesterday. No, maybe better not to publish data, yeah? Something like that, yeah? Or, but we should publish and explain and go f further, yeah? And this is really important, yeah, to accept it's the same uh, life expectancy, Soviet period, yeah? Uh, in, in, it, it, Soviet, okay, Soviet Union was a totalitarian state, but when uh, health uh, system uh, improved, then it was a uh, uh, jump in, 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 life, uh, in life expectancy, and, 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 we, and it was much lower, this, um, uh, this uh, is it, I knew. Infant mortality rate, yeah? Because of global trends in medicine, yeah? And, and we can accept this in 50s, 60s, it happened, yeah? There are some positive things, yeah? Despite of Soviet regime and positive things because, uh, despite of Carlos Ullmans, yeah. Yeah, Kathleen, Kathleen has a question. Okay, this is a mini question from the Norwegian group. The main question will be later for the conclusions. Um, why was there no recession in Lithuania during the 1930s? Well, my main explanation is that Lithuania wasn't as an open economy as others, and therefore it wasn't susceptible for the uh, uh, international shocks as much. Simply, it wasn't trading with the rest of the world as much. Not as large share of its economy was dependent on international trade, and therefore when international trade went down, the Lithuanian economy wasn't as impacted simply because it wasn't as engaged. Thank you. If I may add uh, one comment on, I, I wasn't uh, there yesterday. I understand there was a heated debate on, uh, it, it, I completely understand that it's a Latvian thing. Nothing good can happen in Soviet times. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a political statement. Everybody, the, the only thing is that I was born during Soviet times, so in general something good happened. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but in, I was born in the 1980, so I, I have very limited uh, personal experience with Soviet uh, Union. Uh, but I have heard. But in general, in general, uh, uh, I think nobody with a sound mind in Latvia would say that the life was uh, at the same, or the income of the people, or the uh, opportunities were the same in 1980 than they were in 1945. And then uh, after a war uh, was a real issue with feeding people and many problems with that. And that's understandable that some growth happened. And I don't know why the people are so upset by the fact that it happened. Uh, the, and the houses were built. And if the houses are built, the GDP is grown. We live in those houses now, nowadays, many of our inhabitants. Yeah? Uh, the other issue is which uh, Gatis has published for uh, multiple times with his group is, is, is that the fact that it 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 wasn't uh, 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 first of all it wasn't sustainable growth it was built under the Soviet uh, uh, it, it it isn't a real economy it's it's a it's a uh, co completely state controlled uh, national economy where you are it's not real and and it was completely militarized. Uh, uh, the ma major object was to uh, build necessities for the army, for that to be the, the, uh, the biggest and the strongest in the world. And then uh, only came people with their needs, even not maybe in the second place. Uh, the people were graduate, uh, graduate, the best people get the best, uh, that, that was the system. But in general, uh, there, uh, the, uh, and also Lat Baltics uh, were not only the most developed, which the data shows re a region, it was also the major donor to all the uh, Soviet Union. We, uh, we produced for Soviet Union, and uh, uh, they took our wealth away from us. So it's in a fact there is no, uh, this is a, uh, uh, and a quarrel with data, it's uh, uh, not a very uh, good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I just have two comments as chair of this session. Uh, coastal areas in Europe are very often the most wealthy areas. It applies partly for the Baltic states, but definitely not for southwest Estonia. I wonder why, that's number one. And then I just a comment. I promised uh, Domas I, sh I would not talk about double deflation technique. But I, uh, I'm sorry to, to announce that uh, I have to talk a bit about it. Uh, when you're calculating national accounts, you try to find value added in all the firms, institutions, households, and then you add them. And when you calculate the fixed prices, you can deflate uh, the value added or you can deflate output and input. Well, for uh, Adomas, you, you use basically volumes, so fixed price all the time. So you, you don't even deflate. They are deflated already. But if if one uses double deflation technique, deflate input and output, compared to just deflating value added, uh, there is a clear tendency that in good times, when you use double de deflation technique, uh, they become better because there is the profit is increasing. In bad times, it becomes worse because profit is diminishing. So I would guess that in, in, in the last decades of, of the Soviet period, they had problems, a lot of problems. Growth was going down, problems with profit, if you can call it profit, or yeah. Which means that probably if you were able to deflate, use double deflation technique, I'm, I'm quite convinced that the growth in the 70s and 80s would even be worse. Yeah. So it means that um, probably you would draw a line which is under the line you have, and, and you would see that the turning point could even be a bit earlier. So that's an argument against the Soviet system, really. Okay. But I would like to have an answer from you. Uh, okay, uh, since this is a very fresh uh, research on Estonia, I, I don't have the cor um, precise answer, but my impression was because uh, I'm not sure that the, in that region they have a big port. 
uh, because coastal regions should have a port. Uh, uh, and they then we, uh, they live quite better, and I think all of has so explanation more precise. <laughs> yeah. uh, there are ports, but only for uh, let's say pre-modern ships. So the larger your ship is, the uh, the deeper the water has to be. So Hapsalu or Pernu, you. You can't use them for for modern ships, so no coastal trade. It's fishing trawlers or something like that, or some yachts, but but no no real ports. Thank you. Then uh, you have to go. Good luck to you. Okay. Okay, you, you want to Short question. Looking at this data, it was actually quite interesting. We saw that um, in regional perspective, not much changed, at least relatively to each other. Uh, in in the long run, the GDP was, uh, as you put it, we know how to grow, but we also sort of know how to fall, or actually we're just very volatile in the Baltics compared to other regions. So uh, is there a causality to it? Uh, is there some way to fight it or we have to learn how to live with it? So is it... Yeah. <laughs> That's a good, good question. I think the main solution would be to wipe Russia out of, you know, service. I think that that works best uh, if, if that country stopped hurting us stopped causing world wars, stopped uh, causing regional wars, that would help because the first world war, partly caused by Russia, part, well, in general, imperial politics, right? And that was the first big slump. Second world war, again, Soviet Union and Germany. Big slump, not dependent on the Baltic states. The last one um, was in the 90s. Again, that was because Soviet Union had occupied us and incorporated us into this coercive, inefficient system. So I think as long as the Baltics are left alone to grow in the capitalist system, system under Western, you know, rule, we should do fine. We will have the Western, you know, turning points, but they will be less less uh, crucial and less yeah. devastating. Sorry, but just from the practical perspective, uh, these are big events, but also in smaller events uh, that are not so... Oh, okay, there's a role of, of Russia, let's say, uh, in the recent years. We had uh, the energy crisis. Baltics were hit the hardest. Uh, we had uh, uh, the uh, inflation in the Europe and, and the actions Europe Central Bank took Baltics are getting hit the hardest. We, we fell down the fastest, we are recovering the fastest now, and again we are suffering because rest of Europe is, uh, has more inertia. So we are just volatile. Yeah, and I think that's the, 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 the pattern you see in most of the infant economies. We just haven't built our economies yet to be able to withstand them, to have the depth of you know, taking in the recessions, such as the Scandinavians do. I'd say probably by nine, by 2050 we should be much better at absorbing crisis. Uh, it's just uh, only small remark. Generally, I am agreeing with the Domus. Well, uh, except for World War One, if there were no World One, well, uh, then uh, there would be no independent both sure. states. Sure. So yeah. There would be well part of Russian Empire somewhere. So. You know, this counterfactual history will sometimes... Will uh, yeah, 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 but no, this is really important. <laughs> <laughs> this is really important, yeah, because uh, uh, remember territory of Russian Empire uh, before World War I. Finland, Latvia, for example, two different stories, yeah? And of course, uh, unfortunately, front line, everything, but theoretically, if uh, we... I think, I believe, not only, not because of World War I, uh, yeah, we, we, we voted for, uh, we, we took a decision about our independence, but just unfortunately circumstance of this front line, everything, yeah, destructions, what happened here made us in, uh, us in much worse position, yeah. So 
theoretically, of course, if, 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 of course, if, yeah, if uh, frontline went somewhere in south, some, some, not here, then uh, uh, Baltic uh, in, already in 20s were in, in, in totally different uh, position, like Finland. It's, it's the same, yeah, and, and so, but yeah, I, I agree because uh, it was discussion uh, yesterday if you look the number of population, yeah, and, 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 and today, yeah, so, but yeah, yeah, World War I started, but it, it, it was not so important, yeah, and uh, crucially important uh, to make this world for in our territories, yeah, yeah. Uh, with regards to uh, my argument about the economies being immature, you could also look at the 1930s because Lithuanian economists were not as competent as Latvians and Estonians were simply because our economy had, did not even have any market experience. We didn't have any Hansa towns and stuff. So our economic policy making was completely infant and that correlates with our belated policy decisions compared to Estonia and Latvia. So I would expect as our economies mature nowadays, we are getting more competent advisors, more competent politicians, more competent decision making in general. It should get better. Uh, well, but nevertheless, those black swans happen. Well, uh, and then no competence helps. Well. It was said that it's difficult for historians to to uh, try to foresee what's coming. I think it's very difficult for economists to. Um, uh, but um, if I if if I can come with a, a final final question here, um, because you have talked been talking about it. Um, what what can we do in order probably to stop the the this population <laughs> or or uh, decreasing population in 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 the in the suburb or or, or the countryside uh, what what can be done here uh, well there is no problem actually there is a lot of people wanting to arrive to our countries Two years ago, well, the Lithuanian government was pressed to, well, uh, build this, you know, uh, well, wall, wall, wall from, well, Kalusia uh, Provoka. Well, now all eastern border of Lithuania, how is it in English, Kalusia Provoka? Far wide. Far wide, eastern. Yeah. A lot of people are just looking how to go into that. Yeah. You know, just they are wrong immigrants, not welcome. <laughs> just open and you will populate at all those spaces. <laughs> Latgil and so on. Uh, I would like to add that uh, from my point of view, uh, we need to more uh, to invest in uh, education, also for adult education, that it could be one of the ways uh, how we can uh, increase number of population and attractiveness of our uh, countries for uh, smart uh, uh, immigrants uh, in future. Yes, we need smart immigrants. But so immigrants will come anyway. I probably have a a little bit different perspective. I, I don't think uh, immigration uh, should be the primary primary tool. I would probably say I haven't analyzed this, you know, fertility situation from macro level, uh, or or increasing population from macro level. But from personal perspective, um, it's been advertised in Lithuania that one of our policies recently has been to give tax incentives and uh, loan incentives for young families. Uh, move to move out into suburbs and that recently Vilnius suburb has been excluded from that because people were suburbanizing and still traveling to Vilnius but to further regions and I checked on the actual levels of incentives and they are getting more generous the more children you get so I think we could experiment with this more radically and give even higher incentives for people to move into this, this, the suburbs, particularly for those who have one children, two children, three children, increasingly um, better benefits. So I think that that costs not too much to try for a few years, especially when our economies are growing fast still. 
Uh, but if it works, then it might prove to be a long-term solution. Okay. Oh, got this. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's a very simple. We should just ask our population and just organize survey in three Baltic uh, uh, countries and ask one question. What do you prefer? in 10 years, immigration of uh, 200,000 people in each country or creation of 200,000 uh, robots and replacing you. And then we'll see what the population will vote. Yeah, maybe there's some, maybe some third solution. But very simple because it's age of, of technology. Some solution will be fine, yeah? If not people, then the robots, I think, something like that. <laughs> But I think it's very clear that the mostly um, depopulation in the regions, usually it's economical uh, regions. For example, in Lithuania, like uh, when there was a big ratio of immigration, so uh, the immigration was the second step. The first step was going to Vilnius, after to the capital region. After this, you are going already to immigration uh, to the final step. So it means uh, to uh, making the region in the region something for the people uh, better to live yes so one of this like uh, creating the opportunities maybe to buy flats to, to, to grow families and of course opportunity of work and in uh, indeed after the Soviet Union collapsed lots of industries uh, they were just also collapsing uh, in Lithuania during the Soviet period uh, there was in the re regional policy to making equality regional policy was quite strong and lots of uh, things were created, which after the Soviet Union already uh, closed. So again, tra trying to grow economics in the regions, of course, will attract people in the regions. Because people like live in the regions. Not everyone wants to live in capital cities, but they go there for the economical reasons. Uh, well, just short remark. Well, no, robots or immigration. Well, uh, until immigrants are cheaper than robots. Immigrants will come. Like horses and tractors yeah, and turkeys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. cheaper. Yeah. But, uh, got this. Yeah. This is the final comment. No one is allowed to say yeah. anything after I've said okay. it. You're a musician. And, and, and I guess when you're having concert, uh, like you had in your local church with yeah. some friends, yeah. you want people to come to listen to you. If there is no people, no one would come to listen. Do you want robots to come to listen to you? No, no. no. Okay. <laughs> so people has a value. No, but people should be more motivated to take right decisions sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You say it's other alternatives, yeah, mm. because then it's the alternative. Yeah? Mm. Yeah, yeah. But it's very important information. I looked and other, other session members have already moved to lunch. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will continue our uh, uh, conference uh, with the University of Applied Sciences, Society, Technologies and Solutions. And I will give you now floor to uh, Zenonas Norkus. Uh, he is chairperson of this panel about main findings of uh, Baltic 100 project. Yeah. Panel two, please, yeah. Zenonas. Enjoy yeah. your position. Uh, well, thank you. Well, uh, you know, well, we should depart well uh, on uh, 16 o'clock to well Riga Airport. Therefore, I will be strict uh, and sometimes dic dictatorial. Uh, sorry, but so no more than 15 minutes, absolute maximum. And one, two short questions well, after presentation, and then if we will still have some time, general discussion. So, Olaf, please, you are the first. So, especially I did not prepare any slides, no pictures, and I will show no data here. I'm just speaking about statistics. Dry data are full of surprises, 100 years of Estonian statistics. If you look at the potato harvest per, per hectare, for 1935, 1958, 2012, it's dry data. And even if you split it up in different regions and so on, it's just a figure. Uh, and most of the data comes from analogous sources. You have to bring them into a spreadsheet. So you spend hours and hours with potatoes per, he per hectare or potatoes in total. It's extremely dry and boring, I'm honest. It is not dry and boring in case you begin to see a pattern. And this is a thing historians see from time to time when they use sources. And the pattern of the potato is very clear. The potato is unpolitical. The potato is not interested in war, whether there is collectivization of agriculture or democratic elections in Latvia, the potato harvest is only influenced by the weather, full stop. A unpolitic, an unpolitical plant. Now, is grain political? Well, very much. Grain doesn't like war, grain doesn't like Stalinism, and, and even more, it dislikes um, collectivization of agriculture. But grain harvest would increase in case of a mice campaign. So, grain is influenced by political and historical circumstances and not only by the weather. Yeah? Third example, milk per cow. Again, dry numbers. Measured in kilograms per year. And I remember a propaganda slogan from the Stalinist period in Estonia. Maybe it was an all union propaganda slogan. When a cow gives more than 5,000 kilograms of milk, we will have communism. So, like grain, the milk yield depends very much on politics, uh, meaning during Stalinism, um, the regime moved far and far away from communism because the milk yield was declining. Do you have any idea when Estonian milk cows um, entered the stage of communism, according to Soviet propaganda. After the creation of independence? It was the year 2001. 
and milk cows also love the European Union and NATO because nowadays they produce 10,000 kilograms per year. So, so if you see a pattern, it's not that boring anymore, those figures. Okay, uh, the second part of my presentation is about the surprises. And um, first of all, some of those statistics and statistical publications I've seen already some 20 years ago, so I thought, no, there will not be that much surprises. Um, I, just listed, I just list a few of them. Surprise number one, I was a bit skeptical how much data we could find, recalculate, locate in archives, etc. And it was much more than I have expected. And I could recalculate things from published Soviet statistics and I did not believe before that it's, it's that possible. Um, the oddest statistic I found when scamming through those thousand pages of statistics in search of some data required by Adomas or Senonas. Um, the oddest thing I found was a statistic about the skull form of um, students of the University of Tartu divided into ethnical groups. So you could read about the skull of Estonians, Germans, Jews, and Russians. Published in an official publication by the Stat Statistical Office. Racial science was also active in the Baltics. And it was taken that serious that this kind of data was some pages apart from, let's say, industrial wages. It was as serious. My biggest surprise. Um, another surprise, Sinonas mentioned already data on uh, <clears throat> agricultural workers, but I never realized how many different forms of agricultural workers there were. For one day, for a short period, just for the harvest, for half a year, for one year, male and female, with horse, without horse. And under different conditions, how, well, free board and accommodation or not, or they bring their own lunches with them. So it, highly differentiated. Um, and even on a, on a regional level. So never would have expected this. Um, I think most of us are regularly employed. Very few of us are living as freelancers or self-employed and so on. And of course, looking in the interwar period, into the interwar period, you would expect that, oh yeah, those in agriculture, they are, they are living on a family farm, this is a kind of a family business, they are self-employed and so on. But uh, analyzing one census, I realized less than a quarter of the working population had a regular employment. And the others were either in agriculture, they were helping family members, um, there were people in different trades and, and, and so on. I don't need that much. Okay. So it's, it's quite fascinating to see that 100 years ago, uh, regular employment was the exception, the absolute exception. Um, and the last surprise for the interwar period, farmhands, industrial workers, 
detailed statistics about wages, etc. But information on service jobs, lacking, a black hole. So they had to construct this. All right, I brought you some impressions between dry and surprise. Uh, oh, thank you. Oh, don't run. Oh. Okay, because all of us are so disciplined, we have time for even two or three questions if there are any. Well, if there are no questions, ah, guys, please. It's uh, maybe not so much a question, but a comment, but, but partly a question. It's about uh, this uh, employment in agriculture in the Soviet occupation period. And what we learn from this, uh, this census for 1959, uh, we, we, we learn from this that uh, in some official statistical issues, number of employed people in agriculture was much less. It was about 100,000 difference. It was one-fourth of, of, of a difference in, in Latvia. And it, uh, how we explain this, because they work not in collective farms, yeah, in, in kolkhoz and sokhoz, but just in family cells or, 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 or with children, women with children, something like that. And other what we learned that about it was unemployment in this, uh, this uh, workers of, of industry, industrial workers in this time, some of them didn't work, yeah, uh, time after time. It's something similar in Estonia, but... It's quite similar. Um, and uh, I, I just remember another statistic from 1956 where 120,000 people were working um, in their uh, they, they were working on their own plots or uh, in, in own uh, economic activities. So, for instance, the majority of people who traded on the markets, mm. yeah, where do they come from? Yeah? And, and most, of the, most of those, one out of, uh, one out of six working persons in Estonia in that year was independent, not on a cultures and not regularly employed, but working on their own in one way or the other, and most of them were actually women. So it's yeah. a similar thing. So thank you, Olaf. And uh, now I can proceed to the next presenter. So Baiba, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I'll need to check if this works. Yes. So, um, hello everybody. I'm uh, honored to be here today. Um, my name is Baiba. I'm a student in this university, uh, as well a uh, research assistant um, in this project. Uh, and uh, I work in, um, as well, connected with agriculture. And my field of professional uh, interest and my personal interest is uh, agriculture. And uh, I will present today data about agriculture, but um, I wanted to at first emphasize why um, agriculture is important to us. Um, well, uh, the answer is it directly contributes to um, two of our basic needs, uh, which is security. One is food security, and the second is security, like in general. Um, already Aristotle said that first, a state must have a supply of food. Uh, as well, um, it's important to a country to have self-sufficiency self, self of food. And we are lucky that uh, in Latvia right now, most of the staple foods we can produce, even more than 100% that we need, we can export we get, um, gain um, incomes. And uh, the second is uh, 
national security um, value added uh, to GDP of agriculture uh, is enough to cover our growing uh, defense budget, for example. Uh, so it's, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's normal that uh, importance of agri agriculture in uh, GDP reduces. That's a good sign. Um, but that's in a share, not in a value and uh, importance. Uh, so in this project, we are um, presenting results today. Um, my work was connected with collecting uh, agriculture data to calculate GDP. As well, we uh, made a um, data set. And there was 15 uh, data categories about agriculture. And, to and today, I will uh, tell you more about uh, first of the four parts, which is uh, regarding land cover. And uh, land cover, um, in, uh, land cover is, is what you can see. But the other thing, when we talk about agriculture, we want to know how, how we use the, the land. So land use is slightly different uh, um, how to look on uh, land. And uh, agriculture and forestry together makes the um, main share of total land area as in European Union and even more in Baltic states. So agriculture and forestry in land use uh, sense, it's important to us. And, uh, and as it has been referred, that uh, it may be possible to infer land use from land cover and conversely. So I have data about land cover, but we talk about land use, like using that for agriculture. Uh, as we can see from uh, Eurostat data, that these two uh, are quite close. So we can, comp we can talk about uh, what we have on this land cover and uh, that is used for agriculture. So finally, to this dry data. Uh, in truth, it's quite unique agriculture data set that haven't gathered so far in a digital format. So to easily use with all those fantastic tools we have today for analyzing uh, data. And uh, here you can see 100 years of utilized agriculture area in Baltic countries. Uh, this is as an index form, so we can compare that um, all, three, um, all three countries. And uh, we can see that uh, the area have decreased. If you take a closer look, for example, to Latvia, we can easily distinguish um, four, four like, uh, steps first. Um, Intervar period with a growing uh, agricultural area, then decline during Soviet times, then even sharper drop in this uh, transition period to uh, restoration of independence, and uh, lately again we can see gr growth. Uh, but where the reduces our uh, agricultural area, it's a place uh, for forest area to fill, and uh, that we can see. Uh, in Latvia, and uh, uh, area of um, forest uh, take took over around seven, uh, 70s in Latvia, this leading position. Um, and uh, as well in other Baltic states, uh, we can see that forest area have increased over time. So um, we have more trees that it's more greener. But that's just the first look to this dry data we have. Of course, it's a place to make more deeper uh, future um, research. Uh, one, an another, um, what we did um, in this uh, project, collecting data, was not only uh, national le level, but as well regional level. But there we had some, um, some challenges regarding uh, changing of borders. So, for example, here is a map of Latvia, but during this, this pre, uh, period of 100 years we were searching, uh, the borders of regions were redrawn several times. So, as well, the data we're collecting in those particular time of uh, regions. We try our best to make it uh, 
possible to co uh, compare these data uh, in a actual uh, division of statistical regions in Latvia as, as well in uh, other countries. Uh, and uh, if we see, for example, agriculture area, the red line is uh, national level and the five lines under is five regions of Latvia. So, for example, what we can quickly see uh, when we don't look at the table uh, in, uh, on the paper or on computer, but on, on a graph, we can detect that a dark blue line, which is the region Latgale, uh, have, um, uh, having the highest uh, growth at interwar period, uh, more than other regions, but as well, the deepest decline after World War II, as well, next transition period, which is restoration of independence. So per perhaps it's less resilient to some drastic changes. Then arable land. Arable land is, uh, uh, has the highest um, share of how we use agriculture area. And this uh, share have increased over, over time. Uh, at least in the percentage. Um, and uh, when we see arable land in regions, uh, as well, we can detect similar things as in agric agriculture area, that uh, the highest leap, uh, rise and fall, is for region Latgal, which is a dark blue line, as in interval period, as at um, restoration of independence in 90s. Then arable land and number of cattle. I chose these two because arable land more or less uh, represents crop production and cattle milk production, which are two of the dominant uh, fields of agriculture sectors in Latvia. So what we can see, we can um, easily detect three per period uh, changing tendencies. So first is both are growing at interwar period. Then number of cut, uh, cattle, which is blue line, is going up because of the Soviet time uh, politics as well. Uh, uh, while arable land is slightly decreasing. And then third period is after um, restoration of independence of Latvia, so after this transition period when we needed to restart economy. Uh, uh, it's another trend that uh, arable land is growing, crop production is getting more popular, uh, but um, number of cattle is uh, stagnant or maybe even with a little bit of um, de slow decline. And finally, uh, not to take too much of uh, our time, uh, here I put as well uh, data, not only about agriculture land and uh, um, farm animals, but as well uh, gross added value calculated by colleagues, and which is you can find it in our published uh, database as well. So red line is agriculture area, uh, yellowish <laughs> orange is uh, all farm animals, uh, and uh, the green one is um, gross value added of agriculture. Uh, we don't have that calculated for Soviet time. So let's see, interval period next to last 30 years. And what we can detect here uh, in, with a simple look uh, that uh, in interval period, interval period uh, gross value added growth, but it grow together as well with uh, arable, uh, excuse me, with array of agriculture land and as well of number of uh, animals were increasing. But uh, again, um, in the last 30 years, we can see that uh, gross value added growth uh, for other reasons, because uh, agriculture area and number of animals doesn't grow. So in conclusion, I want to emphasize this is a work in progress, even though our project is close to the end. Um, but we still uh, have managed to make this unique data set with uh, good illustrations for long-term trends. And we can even see some positive developments uh, 
in our data regarding, um, for example, forest uh, in the context of right now very topical uh, climate change mitigation goals that forest areas in long term in our region is growing, not just seeing last five years, but we see last hundred years. Number of animals is reducing, so it's good for methane em emissions and so. Uh, and our productivity is growing, so we can produce uh, more with the less uh, natural resources like land and animals. So that's all. Thank you for, it, for your attention. So thank you, Barbara, for being on schedule. Uh, well, 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 okay, so uh, we are here not alone. Well, we taught us are well, following uh, online our presentation. And well, he did write a mail. Well, you got this and Kaspers also find it. He spotted one bug in a newly released database, uh, so uh, his suggestion is to rename agricultural land into land use, land use, because the category contains forest land, and forest land uh, obviously doesn't belong to agricultural land. So, Kaspers, check, check this, well, you have this information, well, and uh, Maybe we should change re, uh, re, change names in, in in our categories. We know Bible already did this. So yeah, yeah. So 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 thank you, thank you. We told us uh, well, and now well, one or two questions from audience. Please, please, Adonis. Uh, Sorry, uh, please uh, pass the mic. Uh, when you compared uh, and okay, showed and showed the val gross value added, so was that at constant prices or in 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 what? Uh, maybe you can bring back even the slide because I wasn't sure. It seemed like the gross value added in late interwar period was the same as. Oh, you cannot bring back. It's, oh, okay. Um, uh, you will need to listen to one more time all the <laughs> presentation. It was one of the last ones. Yes, yes, the last one. So I think in, in any case, the advice is, yeah, this, these ones, is to specify if gross value added is at constant prices or some sort of uh, currency, because now it seems like in 1940, the value added created in agriculture was three times higher than in 1990. In 2000, yeah. So I think you should specify clearly what the value added is counted by, like what 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 units are being used. Yes, I will specify. Yeah. And, uh, I can check on my computer the data because here I put less numbers, uh, so just to s you see the tendencies and how this data set can be used. Uh, but. Uh, yeah, because it's, if it's in current prices, then the growth in the recent years is inflated a lot. If it's at constant prices, then it's not. So it, it's very important to be aware of Yes, that. but that, uh, that is uh, from the published uh, we have. I think it was only one type of uh, uh, gross value added value. Yes, but you should be very well... Well, conscious. Are those current prices or constant prices? Well, we can talk about this yeah. later right? yes, a little yes. bit. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, another and last question. And if there are no questions, then I would like to invite Ilmars. Ilmars, well. I, ha I have comment please, for please. myself. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Just uh, wait a minute. Like, as this is a work in a progress, uh, of course, we are aware that some mistakes can be found or some improvements as well. So there is an email indicated at the database uh, page where everyone can, who uses these data sets and finds some things that should be improved. You can send suggestions and uh, as I have understood, uh, it will be taken care of for this data set, not like left alone. Yeah, it's... Its name is good practice, practice to well spot and correct mistakes in database. Well, thank you for this information. And, and now perhaps Ilmars, please. Dear colleagues, 
I will miss uh, the honest intellectual jokes and um, everybody else, you know, these challenging discussions with colleagues. But anyway, we will cry later. Now, um, since Zenonas gave me double time until 4.30 today, so I will... <laughs> 50 minutes, great. Uh, <laughs> we will have a little break from dollars or land use to humankind, demography. And uh, if uh, someone actually, actually, I, from time to time I'm being asked, well, can you trust uh, Soviet statistics? Well, and I have prepared the best answer is because the demography statistics was secret up until end of 50s, and then later detailed demography was semi-secret, for service whatever needs. Uh, un unfortunately, it was quite precise. You can always argue if uh, this person was included and other was not, but uh, it was painfully real number, those, the numbers are quite real. So let's see a few interesting uh, slides. And my research was mostly to collect the data that so far uh, have been, um, were not made aware or, or public, published anywhere except for the pre-war where um, as um, you already heard, uh, Latvian uh, statistics uh, from pre-war, even up until the German uh, Nazi occupation, were quite above the average of the standard, uh, quite precise, quite detailed, and then an empty 20 years uh, from the Soviet, and then after uh, starting from late 60s, more or less, you already have some some good data. But uh, luckily, the uh, state archives have surprisingly good data on those uh, then secret uh, data, including regional, so you can uh, collect uh, lots of new information. And obviously, another challenge was that everybody already mentioned how this historic uh, regions uh, we can compare to the current. Well, Pierig is the, the bug, but if we kind of swallow that, then Latvians should be quite happy. Latgal is more or less uh, uh, where it was. The same is Kurzem and Zemgal Vidzim as well. So, uh, and I will most of the time speak about these current nuts, except for the most interesting uh, uh, segment when I will talk about the life expectancy, I cannot recalculate hundreds of thousands of deaths by age of the pre-war, so I have to use the old historic um, uh, regions when I will talk about life expectancy. So the simplest uh, uh, graph uh, is the population dynamics. Uh, and here is already division uh, by, by, the, by the regions, where you have a dominance of Latgale, uh, and still even increased. Somebody has calculated that uh, Latgale or Latgalians gave 75% to natural increase in 20s and 30s, which means that the surplus of birth and death was due to Catholic, and not only Catholic, Orthodox and Old Believer Latgalians. Riga was the second, but then obviously increased a lot because partially also it was the, the capital of the region of the Soviet uh, Empire. Uh, so it was too big, I, as some would think, and then that's why the decline seems to be maybe even faster than other districts. And then the other are somewhere in the middle, except of Pieriga, which used to be the, the smallest. The sand soils, historically, uh, were sparsely populated, uh, so there were poor areas around Riga, but now those are the richest uh, areas. And closer you get to Riga border, the, the richer the municipality is. And here is, I wanted to just give a few interesting, even go to 
below not three to Rajuvans or Nuovats, more or less they are the same. Taking the 1935, and this is Latgalian, uh, Latgale district, all the six or seven uh, districts uh, they have, more or less you can see the same uh, decline, but even maybe faster uh, already during or uh, up before the, till the 59, the first Soviet census. But um, if someone asks a question what we can do so the people return to, I don't know, Ludza, Kraslava, or Balvo uh, regions, countryside, I don't know. Even, even the robots, I don't know how, who will. Yeah, so we must work with the resources uh, we have. And anyone uh, wishing that, so let's find yourself a good example. And instead of living in uh, Ladurga, if you would, or uh, you can buy a house for no price in Zilupe and try to find what you will do there. Um, so that's about that not every, we sometimes have to think how to save the national, let's say, the country level issues. And we have to give up on hopes that every little town or municipality will be surviving another generation with something in. And contrary to this Latgale we just saw, this is Pieriga, uh, more or less uh, grow, well, maybe modest grow, not, to, let's say, Limbaju, which more is belonging to Vidzeme, and that's why in the new version it is subtracted, is actually decreasing, but uh, Riga, district around, where I multiplied current five or seven uh, smaller municipalities, is increasing and probably will increase on, uh, from other parts of Latvia coming to Pieriga and even Riga residents moving out to Pieriga. It's much nicer to live outside of uh, less crowded Riga. Now about a few other um, birth rate. Well, Latgale used to be twice as uh, high on the birth rate, as I said, these three quarters of natural increase. But, yeah, now it's the smallest. But the, actually, the challenge was they, sh even up to the war time, Latgale was no longer um, substantially higher than any other district. So you can say that 20s and 30s, whatever was the politics, I cannot comment if women is did something for the birth rate in Latgale or, or contrary, but the things happen. Well, most likely nobody, Ullman or even Stalin was not uh, guilty for that. It was just that um, demographic behavior, uh, which let's say demographic transition in other parts of Latvia happened, let's say a couple generations earlier, turn on the century, between 19th and 20th century. Uh, from the biologically possible maximum number of children per female down to whatever was controlled birth rate. So Latgale simply joined the crowd a couple generations later. Somewhat Latgale resigns of a Lithuanian increase and the rest of Latvia is this Livonia or Baltic Latvia excluding Latgale and Estonia. Mortality rate, uh, let's skip because there is no increase. The similar trend for the natural increase. Uh, but I want to stop on infant mortality, uh, which I was um, surprised. Uh, and we, it has lots of big impact for the life expectancy. We will just uh, talk a couple minutes later. Uh, and you see how high it was. Well. Um, Latvia was not uh, uh, an exception. Um, all over Europe before the war, from 5 to 10 percent of the newborn babies died before their first birthday, uh, birthday. So this was unfortunately the case everywhere. Actually, if compare, uh, comparing this uh, big drop in 50s and in the beginning of into 60s, uh, even some countries like Germany or Austria was even a little bit slower 
in this drop of infant mortality. So obviously Scandinavia was always uh, um, number one when it was the smallest already, uh, but uh, I was surprised personally that uh, this graph was still, if you take separate regions, it still compares well with the average European. Last five minutes. Okay. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. Yeah, it's still. So let's jump to, yeah, this is one the year, but it pretty much uh, continues the same. We can take here uh, by the district, uh, and Latgalian three. Yeah, and here is ethnicity, uh, where you have uh, Latvian 6%, Germans and Jews the smallest. Uh, in, and I was even checking, uh, got this intrigued me, I checked, well, how about Jews in Latgale? Maybe the poorest Jews in, uh, in Varakljani, Viljani, who would still have a relatively higher infant mortality. No, they had the same low, approximately twice as low than their Catholic neighbors in the same uh, little town. And the highest it was for both uh, Russian Orthodox denominations and Poles, Lithuanians, and, but they were smallest. Now, here I into some of the other countries, like with, when we compared with the blue, Scandinavians always had already lower, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, Germany, Switzerland, Austria, the green ones, surprisingly similar. And sometimes, uh, Wiedzeme, for example, had a lower infant mortality than Austria. It was a novelty for me. Now, the exciting part in the last uh, 15 minutes uh, is Miroshe uh, Petratsum, the dead guys by the age. These are unique um, handwritten uh, tables for each year, for each, uh, and this, now we turn to historic, uh, mm, not three, not the current ones. And so with this, thanks to statistics office, they kindly calculated uh, with the current methodology, they use modern calculations of life expectancy, also these historic, so that no one could say that there's some methodology, as always there could be. And the results by regions, uh, and unfortunately only these uh, seven years I was able to locate, so maybe I will find something more, but surprising uh, difference um, is between uh, where you have, well, approaching, if you take uh, the yellow one, it's approaching 62 in uh, mid, in 30s, and Latgale, which was like in other continent, uh, it was uh, so different, well, Africa was much lower, but let's say somewhat uh, close to Poland, uh, Lithuania, not as low as in Russia. In these years, in Russia, it was not even 40, it was below 40, so 49 was a modest, uh, a modest result, but still, so what was good in interesting uh, in this, uh, in the see seven years that the difference from maximum to minimum, here it's uh, 10, actually if you add those digits it's closer to 11, down to seven only. In seven years this is huge difference. And, uh, and um, let's jump across. Here, that's the last slide, <laughs> I included the historic life expectancy and modern life expectancy calculated, and practically the same five years difference, because only thing I'm taking life expectancy for one year, those who survived until one year, those, like, because if 10% uh, of children dies, obviously this, this spoils life expectancy. But this was removed uh, in 50s and 60s, so if we can uh, ignore that, then the higher and the lowest, being uh, again uh, Vidzeme or Pierig and Latgale, has the same five, six years. So whatever the government of Latvia have achieved in order to improve the regional uh, segregation and bring Latgale closer to other parts of uh, uh, other regions of Latvia. Last minute. Yeah, thank you. Actually, I'm 
Yeah, finishing. This was not continued during the Soviet, and it is still not continued during uh, modern independent Latvia. The same five years difference is in uh, 2021, 2022. Surprise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we have time for one, two, maximum three questions. Please. Yeah, okay. of course. Uh, of course. Okay. I have a question. How you explain this uh, difference uh, in this uh, uh, mortality rates between uh, different ethnic groups? And uh, because we see in one town, yeah, Jewish, uh, Latgalian, Russian populations in Latgal, it's huge difference, yeah? We did for purpose something bad for Russians or something like that, yeah, it was... Well, I will speculate, but it seems that the only difference I can give is education and religion. As is the population more educated or less educated, as we know, when Latgale was so different from the rest of Latvia, uh, still in 20s and 30s, about one third was illiterate. Maybe I'm very unprecise data, just don't quote me on that, but significant population, where the rest of Latvia was already 90, whatever, over percent literate. And also different religions play, play a role quite uh, substantially, where lo Protestants uh, and, at first, Jews were more trusting, I don't know, doctors or something than the, the other religions. And I guess the maximum, the opposite maximum are not even Catholics, but old believers. They are the most, uh, kind of say, not accepting uh, uh, doctors, just if someone has to die, you know, invite the priest, but uh, not try to not prevent it. And just uh, before the second question, uh, one which I missed the slide, was compared Latvia and uh, Finnish, Finland's uh, life expectancy, both genders, where Latvia dominated uh, in 20s and 30s, and still continued to dominate after the war. There are no data for Latvia in the middle. And then for almost 50 years stagnation and even decrease in Latvia, and not only Finland, most of other, well, every other European country went above Latvia, and most of uh, Asian, Latin America, some African countries uh, had higher births, uh, sorry, life expectancy compared to Latvia. Thank you. Thank you. Ola? Um, when you look into Eurostat data, uh, concerning life expectancy today and looking for differences in income or in education. Uh, the lowest 20% income group and the highest 20% income group have a difference between 7 and 10 years of life expectancy. I'm speaking of today and it's the same uh, concerning education, if you just have a sort of basic, the lowest possible education in comparison to a university degree, this makes between seven and 10 years of life, life expectancy. So maybe the, this huge regional difference might at least partly be explained by the factors of income and Education. Probably, yeah, because the religion is very difficult to measure uh, how religious you are. One thing is to be a member of whatever denomination, but whether, whether you, how you act in the serious situation, then it's something, uh, something else, yeah. So, very good comment. I completely agree that it must be, must be the case. That's why I was surprised uh, for Riga where how Riga was the second lowest with the birth rate being the, but obviously the, not everyone was rich in Riga, uh, and still not, uh, not everyone is rich, but th those years, this, uh, those were the poor um, workers, uh, suburbs uh, that uh, pushed it uh, way below average. 
So thank you. Can I just... I, please, okay. About religious affiliation and life expectancy. There was a study from Ohio, a recent study, which shows, I'm quoting, those who obit listed a religious affili affiliation lived 9.45 years longer than those who didn't. That's Ohio, it's modern, modern times. Um, the gap shrunk to 6.48 years after gender and marital status were taken into account and down to 3.84 after taking into account uh, alcohol consumption and tobacco and so on. So, which means that it, it can, it's, it's really a strong factor. <laughs> yeah, but obviously religion 100 years ago and religious affiliation today, something happened in this century, I believe. Changes. Yeah, but still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it changed. Yeah, but yeah. probably yeah. education, income mm, plays significant role. Yeah. So thank you very much. And yeah, I yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well. one more question. No, very short comment. Yes, I believe that uh, educated and rich people live longer, but they have less children. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. <laughs> Okay, okay, so well, thanks for Il Tulmos. And now well, I, I want to invite our last presenta presenter, Janis Schillings, please. Thank you very much. Hello. So, uh, yesterday and today we are celebrating our expected results of our project, like uh, estimations of. Uh, uh, historical GDP and estimations of regional GDP, but in my opinion, very important are also unexpected results of, uh, because almost every research has some unexpected uh, outcomes, some uh, research questions which cannot be answered in a particular project, but it leads to maybe other uh, interesting uh, projects in the future. So. Um, I will start with uh, uh, the year which Adomas uh, did uh, highlight uh, in his, uh, during his uh, post-Second World War uh, GDP estimations that there is a huge problem with the year 1962. How, how it is possible that there is uh, a drop uh, in this uh, uh, national GDP per capita? Uh, and we see that uh, also, for example, in Lithuania, there is stagnation already in 1960, and then there is 1961. In Latvia, it's dropping even. And uh, the first uh, assumption was uh, that it is connected to crop failure. Then Ilmar suggested that for Latvia, it could be those uh, repressions against uh, local elites. Uh, we know them as uh, national communists. And we haven't studied, actually, the economic impact of uh, those uh, Soviet policies against local elites. And uh, we could assume that, uh, yes, uh, they, they did uh, have some impact because uh, those repressions were also against uh, uh, economical leadership of our uh, republic. And uh, uh, we could also look at what happened to uh, Estonian or Lithuanian uh, elites at the time. And uh, then I also, one of my suggestions was what, uh, that uh, maybe this is connected to uh, so-called Khrushchev's corn campaign at the time, uh, because uh, there was uh, this uh, Moscow's initiative to grow a new crop, which was very, uh, with high potential, demonstrated in the United States, and that we could introduce this new crop, and uh, uh, like uh, uh, this increase our agricultural production and so on. Uh, so uh, I looked into. Uh, this uh, data collected by Gatis, and I saw that, yes, indeed, uh, in late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, Latvia, for Latvia it was culmination of this uh, corn production, uh, and actually huge resources were allocated for this purpose. And there's a, a citation with very small letters, but uh, it's uh, from a book uh, we published uh, last year from uh, one uh, uh, communist who was, before the war, uh, he was 
driver for Cheka, uh, for NKVD. And after the war, he, um, he was assigned to lead the collective farm. And he uh, wrote in his memoirs that uh, actually, yeah, they were assigned to sow uh, 300 hectares with uh, this uh, uh, corn. Uh, and uh, they sowed only 90 hectares. And almost nothing grew. Only two or three hectares had uh, some, uh, some real uh, production. Uh, but of course, there is a plan. Uh, government uh, has uh, said how much they should grow, and of course uh, they didn't report that. So uh, the one thing is, uh, which was uh, uh, actually, of course, I knew it before this project, but uh, uh, this project uh, highlights the importance of uh, uh, going through uh, Soviet statistics, maybe comparing it to local uh, reports, and finding how much was uh, this inflation of uh, uh, numbers, actually, or at least try to est uh, estimate it. And uh, uh, this subject actually has some personal ties uh, to me, because uh, my grandmother was um, a professor of biology in Latvian University. She was the first Latvian woman to receive doctoral degree after Second World War in Latvia. And uh, she was, yeah, sh her, uh, her research subject was corn, because uh, there were huge problems uh, uh, with the, this culture, and also uh, all the uh, scientific resources were put to solve this problem, because everyone saw, uh, saw that uh, it is a uh, uh, very huge uh, waste of resources and so on. So, uh, I remember how my grandmother, maybe 30 or 35 years after, uh, after this uh, uh, time, uh, when she researched uh, the influence of light intensity on growing uh, corn in Latvia, uh, she uh, told me as a small boy that, oh, you don't uh, understand how, uh, what, what it actually meant for us. Uh, uh, for scientists and um, for those people working in those farms to grow this uh, um, actually political crop. We, we heard that uh, uh, potatoes uh, are a political, but corn at the time was actually a very political crop. So, uh, and uh, I think that it would be of great value to look more into this. We don't know how much it costs for Latvia or Estonia or Lithuania to grow this uh, uh, corn, to follow this uh, Moscow's uh, uh, agenda, uh, because huge resources were wasted uh, for this crop. Uh, then, OK, here's Jurgit's uh, work uh, also. Uh, we already saw. Uh, uh, this regional uh, GDP disparities in uh, current day uh, statistical regions in nuts uh, regions, and here are historical regions. And I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, very interesting is Latgal's data, because if you look at the other regions, every region during the interwar period uh, dropped uh, regarding this, uh, uh, in according, according to uh, this uh, average uh, level of, uh, uh, of uh, GDP per capita except Latgale. So Vidzemes numbers are lower than in 1925, the same for Kurzem Latgale, uh, for Zemgale, uh, and uh, Riga stayed almost the same, but Latgale grew. How it was possible if, the, uh, if uh, uh, there were fewer, uh, uh, the, uh, the population was uh, with less uh, Education, less educated, and uh, there were not so uh, huge, uh, um, huge uh, like manufacture and so on and so on. So uh, I think uh, it's very interesting and very important to look at the policies actually implemented in Latgal at the time, and I hope that uh, we can study it in the future years. We are now preparing application for the new research project where we are going to compare Vidzem with Latgale after uh, two, uh, two world wars and to look also in these policies and uh, how it was possible that uh, uh, Latgale did uh, better than every other uh, region in Latvia. 
And to uh, conclude my presentation with the third, uh, uh, at least for Zenonis, who, who is complaining that he hasn't seen any photo of uh, our great economist Alfred Zechner, so I will show uh, the photo of him and his family in the next slide. But uh, this was initiative from uh, Zenonis, who pointed out, actually, he, it was even before this uh, project when uh, in one of his publications he mentioned Alfred Seichner as uh, top five Latvian economist at the time. And he is uh, extensively cited in Latvian uh, uh, literature concerning uh, economical history. And uh, Professor Strang uh, mentions him uh, many times, but uh, we lacked uh, biographical data about him. We didn't know even the date of his uh, death and uh, about his family circumstances and so on and so on. And it was very exciting uh, to find uh, information about him in our archive and to um, give credit to this important person in Latvian economic history. and. I hope in in the next few months uh, we will have also published. Uh, I will have published uh, the article in uh, our journal of uh, Latvian archives about him, uh, about his um, very interesting life and his experiences fighting uh, fighting um, different ministries and politicians and uh, uh, and uh, about his life in um, exile in United States. Uh, and uh, also, I hope that, uh, yes, we can uh, further this research and publish um, maybe a book uh, about him. I hope so. And here is his passport. And uh, on the right side is his um, is a photo from Seattle newspaper, from the United States newspaper, a uh, few months after his um, immigration to United States, he was interviewed, uh, and uh, also there was taken a photo of him um, and his wife and his uh, daughter. So these are some leads and some potential subjects uh, which are important and intriguing for me. And yes, I'm very uh, grateful for this project and for this, uh, these interesting three years, which have been very valuable um, for um, I, I think uh, most of us. So thank you very much and hope to cooperate uh, with you also in future. Uh, does the corn reduction and corn production fully uh, explain the 1962 drop, or or, or not not um, enough? I haven't looked into in detail, mm. so but it's one of possible explanations, at least in my mind. Okay. Yes, but uh, I think there's a more general this issue because um, this uh, idea of forcing to grow a crop in Latvia where it hasn't grown uh, uh, historically, to uh, put a, such great resources to do that, to get some results, but uh, actually how much it cost for, for the agricultural sector, which had to, uh, had to use extra fuel and extra um, workforce and so on. Uh, I think uh, this is very interesting to look at it, but yeah, there can be other explanations mm. as well. This was just a very interesting one, which also had some um, personal meaning for me, so I presented it to you. Okay. Valdius. So, well, Kasper, so. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe during those times uh, there is, uh, well, not crop or something along but uh, the same lines is Latvani, which I also introduced. Uh, yeah. And now we have problem. Yeah, I, I'm not sure in which year I should check uh, <laughs> the historical records <laughs> when they were introduced in Latvia. Yeah, maybe. But uh, 
but uh, but with corn you can see that uh, there were put huge resources and huge even uh, scientific effort to to for, to 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 grow this crop but it wasn't so with latvian as i would exp maybe there was also yeah some uh, some effort in that but i don't know yeah Ah, yes, Soviet occupation had uh, very different and uh, sometimes very interesting consequences, yes. As I don't know how it's in, in English, Aertes on Aertes encephalites and even uh, diseases and so on, so yeah. Uh, yes, uh, I, I have a proposal, maybe we can uh, improvise and now we will start last discussion, last 10 minutes general discussion about uh, Agita, please come on, and, and Martin, just in 10 minutes we can discuss next steps what to do. Because you should leave, yeah, after. Yeah, we should leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you stay. was too close. At this and and, uh, and, and Jurgita, Jurgita, please, yeah. Yes, yes, you, yeah, yeah. And uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, uh, one question to everyone. Uh, Recommendation or some if we will receive funding, yeah. And so, what to do next? Uh, what, yeah, Martin, please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, what, what, uh, what to do next uh, uh, in the next project? What is interesting? What you learn here and what to do next? Yeah, maybe Jans, you can start. Yes, yeah. I have a lot of ideas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, there are some uh, we have already shared uh, within our our discussions. For first of all. Uh, there was argument about uh, this imperial influence, uh, that Russian influence, that uh, you should uh, take out Russia and then we will prosper. But uh, to uh, answer to this question, 100% we should make Baltic 200. Because uh, uh, we could take this 19th century, which wasn't turbulent century, and we were under Russian Empire, and study these policies, and if we see that uh, actually this uh, growth was made uh, was more because of our local effort, not uh, the imperial policies, then you could say yes, uh, this is uh, actually uh, this is our accomplishment. It's not because of uh, uh, some uh, Russian uh, Russian investments and so on. Second one is uh, what I see that uh, we should. Um, that is uh, necessary is this uh, research of living standard in, Lat in Baltic states uh, during the last hundred years because uh, those numbers of uh, GDP they are not representing the actual situation on the ground <laughs> as to say uh, for uh, actual uh, people living here so it's uh, we should uh, uh, how, uh, somehow uh, 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 explain these um, statistical data and show how what was the situation uh, uh, actual here. And um, the third one is uh, that uh, I think that these uh, comparisons between uh, different regions are very perspective. And we have already talked about it and we have a project proposal in the Horizon program uh, concerning this issue and also uh, working on a new proposal. So those are, I think, three things that could... Perfect. Okay, Jurgita. Okay, so uh, first, of course, uh, the Soviet period for regional um, um, inequalities, uh, because we need to, to find the methodology to create new maybe new methodology, which would be good to estimate these regional inequalities, and uh, to, of course, uh, to look what data are possible to, to get. Um, there is also one gap uh, which was seen in uh, also in Adama's paper uh, in Adama's presentation. We estimated in indirect methods the GDP per capita for 1913, and Adama's estimate starts in 1920, 1919. So it's, we still have this uh, war period gap, and uh, we could estimate earlier, maybe from the beginning uh, of the 20th century, just to see the whole development and uh, to, to see how we lived earlier uh, and to see the crisis, how we go because, uh, okay, one number for 1913 and then some small gap. So um, estimates would be very good in this direction also. Okay, thank you. 
Martin. Uh, or enough much. already. Sorry? Oh, uh, enough or some new ideas? <laughs> well, I, first of all, I sort of encourage people to think uh, critically about uh, what are the pitfalls of this sort of a volume approach that was shown us today. So, so I, I guess it's it's good that we have it, but um, but um, all these examples, which maybe you also have brought, uh, maybe they also hint at this this problem, which. Uh, kind of uh, also in this political discussion, how good was the Soviet growth and so on. And I guess one of these um, issues is that um, mm, in this volume approach, we don't really account for the, for the cost. So what's, what's the cost of production the, producing these things? So in your, in your peaks example, if uh, if the food for pigs is imported from uh, from uh, other parts of the Soviet Union, from Canada, actually, <laughs> yeah, but, but <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Then it, it was imported maybe free of charge. So, yeah, yeah. so you know, the the factor cost is maybe very low, and then you can boost production here, and then also take it back for consumption, and this may be one reason why you have this discrepancy between people feeling that the living standard is not what it shows in the picture of your volume growth. So, but I don't know. Maybe this is a small thing, you know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, comment. There is also a tendency. I don't know about Soviet Union, but that input is increasing relative to output in most industries. And if that happened here too, which I guess it did in agriculture, it also means that uh, the economic growth is exaggerated in, 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 in these figures. Um, so same as you, you're, in, you're really into double deflation and costs and, uh, and so on. And, and, and the same thing that the ratio between input and output is probably not stable. So, so, so there are there is a lot of things that, in my opinion, points to the to the conclusion that economic growth is rather exaggerated than uh, than the opposite in, in in these figures. So, yeah, my my point is that these things need to be explained. So let's say if we compare this time series of uh, pre -war, pre, uh, interwar period, Soviet period, and the uh, new independence period, then in the middle there is, is a period where, um, let's say, the access to chemical fertilizers is almost, you, you can get whatever you want. So they will send it from, from somewhere. <laughs> Whereas in these other, pr other periods, the producers themselves have to find them and calculate what is the price of this. So, so I guess these kind of small things might be big things have to be explained why we see something on the on the figure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Agita. Your suggestions, recommendations. I am not a member of the project team. Uh, I am not deep in in, the, uh, in this research project. But uh, when I uh, heard the uh, findings and results uh, of the uh, project, um, I can uh, say that uh, they are uh, valuable and it's possible uh, to use uh, them uh, to make uh, some uh, ideas and uh, decisions for the future uh, because we see that uh, historical practices are coming back. For example, uh, one of you uh, mentioned this uh, that uh, during uh, and uh, 20 and 30s that there are uh, only a couple of people with regular employment. And I am sure that it will come back, and it's coming very soon, that uh, we will not be uh, stable positions uh, in the next uh, 20 years, that uh, we can uh, make uh, some uh, conclusions from the past. Uh, what else? Uh, I am happy that uh, you uh, created this open access database uh, that uh, 
It can be uh, used for other researchers, uh, also in other fields, and uh, it will help for uh, executive staff also. Uh, I remember my job interview in Ministry of Environment Protection uh, more as 25 years ago. Uh, assessment committee asked uh, to me, uh, what is my uh, opinion? Uh, do we need uh, to invest and support Latgala region? <laughs> and uh, yes, maybe some of this data can uh, help uh, to provide answer. Okay, Zenanas. Uh, well, Basically, I agree with your Gita. Well, uh, I, I, I don't think that we should try to cover next hundred years well, back from 1920, but well, it may be realistic to cover the years between 1897 and 1914. 14. I mean, first, well, the last years of 19th century and first decades of uh, 20th century. Well, because similar research is done for Russia, well, uh, on government level, so there are some examples. Uh, well, uh, well, and of course, uh, we can think about well, filling out this uh, well, uh, gaps for Soviet period. But for this goal, we should have preconditions to have reliable national level GDP estimates. Well. I personally, uh, I accept, I agree with what the Adomas well, did, but your Adomas see there is some well, reluctance of uh, uh, all uh, proposals, some double deflation, something else. So uh, <laughs> under condition, uh, if we will have uh, broadly acceptable, well, good estimates, national level GDP for Soviet period, so we, we can go back to those regional GDP and try to close, well, uh, those gaps. And, well, I, I think, you know, uh, about our database. Y you know, it can so happen, we will did it, and it will so remain. Maybe people will use, use well, or, or not. Well, uh, but good practice, good practice is that uh, you, after launching some database, are updating it after some time, enlarging, putting well uh, new data sets. And well, one of the ideas for the SQL project is updating and enlarging this database with new series, with longer series. Well, it can be hub, hub, you know, uh, for this continuation work, work well. Well, and, uh, but in which direction this continuation can go. It's it's open for discussion. Uh, what, what I what I told. Well, I told. Okay then. Yeah. Uh, uh, our time, not yeah. for project, not for our next project, but for this discussion and this uh, this conference day is over. What I really see that uh, nothing is finished with this. Yeah, we have a lot of ideas. Thank you for everyone. Yeah, and uh, let's uh, try uh, to develop next ideas in a different participations in project proposals. Thank you very much for this and good luck. To, ah, yes. If it's uh, totally a uh, closing uh, part, then I wanted uh, uh, to say from my side, I am not a historian, but uh, I uh, heard uh, a lot uh, during today and uh, read about uh, your uh, presentations and articles. And uh, it is very important for everyone uh, of us uh, and uh, for uh, different, uh, with different backgrounds uh, of education to understand and be able to tell uh, about country history uh, to our uh, foreign guests uh, that everyone uh, must be able uh, to explain our history. Yeah, very good, yeah. Okay, then, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah.